Shadow Campaign 2024, or perhaps nothing, but we don't know. Right now on X, there are a few viral posts highlighting that hundreds of thousands of people in key states like Texas and Arizona have registered to vote without IDs. The argument is that these are likely people who are granted social security numbers for work permitting reasons and then registered to vote because these numbers are massive and strange. Now, nobody knows for sure. Some people are pushing back a little bit, but considering the volatile nature of 2024, it's good to talk about these things early and see what we come up with, uh, what we can come up with and figure out. Donald Trump is campaigning on Biden's border bloodbath, which is brilliant branding and marketing. And I saw one tweet where he said November 5th will be Christian Day of Visibility when Christians make themselves visible by voting overwhelmingly. So we'll talk about that. Plus, big news, of J.K. Rowling over in the UK, they passed this hate speech bill where if you post something that is likely to offend a marginalized group, whether intentional or not, they can arrest you. So J.K. Rowling basically was like, I'm going to go off, started calling out a bunch of creepy individuals who have been criminally charged, masquerading as trans. And the police were like, OK, OK, we're not going to arrest J.K. Rowling. But of course they won't. She's super wealthy. They'll still go after the little guy who can't fight back. So we'll talk about that. Before we get started, my friends, head over to castbrew.com to buy coffee, the best coffee you'll ever have. Appalachian Nights is so good. We struggle to keep it in stock. So we told our distribution partner, hey, just keep roasting it. Keep making it. We'll keep up those orders. Of course, we've got Alex Stein's Primetime Grind, two times caffeine. Drink responsibly. It's a lot of caffeine. And then, of course, we've got a bunch of other blends like Mr. Bocus Pumpkin Spice Experience. And I'm going to let you guys in on a secret. Many people said... You really should carry pumpkin spice year round because everybody loves it so much. And then, you know, what we found people actually don't want to drink it out of season. No wonder it's seasonal. It's the only time they can sell it. But uh, this is the final run because Mr. Bocus unfortunately has passed. And so also realizing that people don't really want pumpkin spice out of season. We're going to make something different for Mr. Bocus, but uh, support Cast Brew Coffee because it is our company. We sponsor ourselves, and you you are helping us when you buy from Cast Brew to set up our physical location where we are going to have live events. We had our first event last month. The next event is uh, currently underway. If you'd like to come to a live showing of TimCast IRL in Martinsburg, West Virginia, you got to be a member. So go to TimCast.com, click join us, become a member, and you'll get access to the uncensored members-only shows Monday through Thursday. You don't want to miss them there at 10 p.m. And you will get as a member an email when we do our private members only live showing. So we don't advertise these. We don't put them on the website. We only do it through email. So check your email and you'll get access to the Discord server, which is basically a chat room where you can hang out with like minded individuals and building networking, building a network and networking is the most important thing you can do in winning a culture war. So please consider joining TimCast.com and becoming a part of the Discord server. Don't forget to smash that like button. Just just click the like button. Subscribe to this channel. Share the show right now wherever you can. Joining us tonight to talk about this and everything else is Nick Freitas. Thank you very much for having me. Who are you, sir? What do you do? Well, um, husband, father to uh, three, um, former Green Beret back when I was in shape. And then uh, I'm currently serving as a member of the Virginia House of Delegates. But other than that, I'm a pretty good person. All right. on. Yeah. Glad to hear it. <laughs> we can talk about uh, the inner works of politics for sure. So yeah. thanks for coming by. Oh, no, my pleasure. Hannah Claire is hanging out. Hey, I'm Hannah Claire Brimlow. I'm a writer for SCNR.com. That's Scanner News. I'm really happy to be a part of that team. Ian's here. Hi, everybody. Ian Crossland. Hello. It's Ian's birthday. Happy birthday, Ian. Happy birthday. I don't normally celebrate. We should talk about tradition tonight because I don't normally celebrate days just for the sake of it. It's like if somebody does something great, I want to celebrate that that accomplishment so i'm kind of you don't want to celebrate that you've lived another year yeah like i didn't do anything great today i just slept in like maybe <laughs> ce celebrate me on the days that i come in hard and do we tried to wake him up for physical for personal training yeah. but he was like, I, was, I did too birthday? much caffeine i had those yerba mate i had like i was up to like i five told you not to drink too those. much caffeine so i'm going low caffeine from the, other, now on. the other night ian grabbed two yerbas yeah and i'm like don't drink the he second one like, like, i love them they're amazing caffeine. they're delicious but it's got like it's like that was like four cups of coffee so i was i, I was up way too late so i'm gonna lower my caffeine who's intake who's it, stealing all my yerba Probably it was me. I drank like four of them from that. No, down oh, here. No, I have my touched. own thing. You have a secret stash? That's hilarious. <laughs> I have, yeah, I have my ear, but it's, it's half gone. I don't know. Not I know me. it's good, but I'm going to have to... Yeah, it is delicious. I'm going to have to walk around with a stick and well, wave it at people when they take my yerba. <laughs> Thank you for the happy Get birthday, everybody. And yeah. um, Nick, it's good to see you again. Also, when we first met, you were running. I, I believe you were actually in the process of running for Congress when we met. And then next, the second time I saw you, you were in Congress. So it's really cool. I well, think. I, I'm in the so the state legislature. I think the first time you had me on, it was because we had a huge dust up with the guy who's now the Speaker of the House. But him and I kind of 
yeah had had a bit of a bit of a fight on the floor and uh but you were not in the legislature that time, i was right? you, i oh, was you in the legislature. Oh, cool. yeah, okay. yeah yeah let's go deep man yeah. all right hey serge hey Ian. happy birthday uh yeah let's get to it let's go so let's just start with this story it, it was it was kind of hard i don't know if we wanted to lead with this because it is a bit of conjecture but it is incredibly interesting take a look at this from end wokeness the number of voters registering without a photo ID is skyrocketing in three key swing states, Arizona, Texas, and Pennsylvania. I just really want to point out Texas, a swing state. That's crazy. Since the start of 2024, 1,250,000 people have registered in Texas without an ID. In Pennsylvania, 580,000. In Arizona, 220,000. HAVV, that's Help Assisting Voters of Verification or something like that, allows voters to register with a social security number, four digits. I illegal immigrants are not able to get licenses there, but they can get social security cards for work authorization permits. The data is publicly available. We have this tweet from Paul A. Zipila, probably pronouncing that wrong. He says 227,077 people in Texas registered to vote without a photo ID during the week of March 16th, 2024. Nothing to worry about here whatsoever. Totally legitimate. He says, to clarify, see the explanations of terms and associated columns. Then see the blue highlighted row. That's Texas. The 227,000 are total transactions with 196,000 matches, 192,000 single match alive. So it appears as many as 196,000 people registered to vote without a photo ID. There were 30,000 total non-matches. That would imply of the, the 30,000 non-matches are people who tried to register with fake social security numbers or for whatever reason submitted a registration form with a social security number on it and it got rejected by the social security administration. So take a look at this. This is the website. I pulled up the week ending March 16th. This is ssa.gov. This is the Help America Vote Verification Transactions by State. And let's just make sure we have this, this, this correctly. When it says... Uh, um, well, where is the uh, total non-matches, total, total number of verification requests where there is no match in our records on the name, last four digits of the social security, social security number or date of birth. So I'll stress that again. When they highlight 30, actually, I can just pull it up right here. Let's, uh, let's, let's jump to uh, Texas and we can see total non-matches for Texas, 30,499 in one week. That's like 15 times more than the next greatest i mean that's more than any tennessee has zero it's as many as pennsylvania even just had registered is the amount of fraudulent attempts no no no, in no texas. They, they may not be fraudulent yeah may not be many fraudulent. of them could be someone put their number down wrong okay and it came back and got rejected however holy crap 1.2 million in texas since the start of this year i think this is important because it may be nothing we don't know uh scott pressler chimed in he says People need to understand that you do not need a photo ID to register to vote. In order to register to vote, you need either a driver's license or the last four of your social security number. If someone does not have a driver's license, they use social security number. For voter registration, there is also a box that voters must check to indicate they're American citizens. As someone who registers voters across the country, I know this information firsthand. Furthermore, we are also registering a lot of Amish to vote. Amish do not have a photo ID. I'm not saying these numbers reflect Amish voter registration. The information above just serves to point to other ways people may register to vote. I have reached out to two congressmen about the issue. So before anybody jumps the gun, the first thing I want to point out is there could be a regular, say, 30 year old dude living in uh, you know the outskirts of Austin, Republican, and he's like, I'm going to register to vote. And they say, you can use your ID or your social security number. He's like, I'll use my social. It's easier. Last four, I've got to pull up my ID. I've got to put in all those numbers. I'll just do that, right? So this could be totally on the level. Again, that being said, I think considering the shadow campaign Time Magazine wrote about and the fact that we're seeing these massive numbers in key swing states in places like Texas, Arizona, and Pennsylvania, which is clearly here reflected, Missouri, uh, interestingly, has a large number as well. I think we definitely want to pay attention to this. Um, I don't know that anyone actually caught anything, but I certainly think this should be investigated now. Yeah, this social security. I also number, don't think it will be. This no. is what I'm wondering if I'm in Texas and I'm like, hi, my name is Nick Freitas and I have your social somehow. And yeah. I'm like, and these are the last four digits of my social security number and I vote this way. Can I do that? Is that what they're letting people do? 
Well, you got to understand, like in a place like Virginia, where we now have same day voter registration, the, the bottom line is, is that you're going to go through this process. And unless they have a way to, to really check this automatically right off the bat, which quite frankly, if they show up to a polling location to do this, they're not going to be able to get that instant verification. And they may give you a provisional ballot, but then you figure all that out. That gets counted in what, three days later when they've already declared the, the winner, they're going to come back and really scrutinize that. No, they're only going to scrutinize it to the degree that they want to scrutinize it. And that's that's the problem with all of this. When you make it easy to cheat, it doesn't mean that everyone cheats, but enough people can cheat. And then enough other people look at that and goes, something is wrong with this system. There doesn't seem to be sufficient accountability. There doesn't be sufficient transparency. And so you you actually end up undermining the process, even if you haven't done something wrong. And I, I think it's only going to get worse, especially right. when you're looking at a place like Texas. I mean, it, yeah, it's interesting that we live in a, a culture and society that says uh there has to be a nefarious reason that this looks out of whack, right? Mm. Like we are aware enough now that there is, uh, there are errors that occur in voter registration and that some people may benefit from that. Mm. Uh, and I think that that fear is going to, you know, you would hope that it would drive people to the polls. So it's yeah. something's wrong. I've got to act. On the other hand, you know, when you look at a number like 30,000 in Texas, when other states haven't registered anybody, it looks extremely odd, especially given uh, the situation at the border, which the, which Texas has to respond to. 190,000. The 30,000 is just the people that turn, came back. Right. I, I don't. So you're saying, Nick, like because it's at a polling station, they don't have enough dat time or equipment to be like to verify. So if I give them a social and a fake name. So obviously, with this with Texas, we're talking about March, right? So they're they're going to the DMV or wherever it is in order order to register. Each state is a little bit different on on how you get to register. But like in a place like Virginia, where we have same day voter registration, and you can walk all the way up to the polling location, register that day, and then vote. You're not going to get the same degree of of verification that you would through a regular process where you actually have adequate time. And so sometimes the way they try to do that is they'll give you a provisional ballot and you're supposed to keep the provisional ballots, you know, separate. And then you go through those after the fact and they're supposed to go through additional scrutiny. Again, where where people are losing trust with this, I'll give you I'll give you a very personal case from 2020. Right, this was the year in in Virginia. It's COVID. We had a bunch of uh, we had a special session where Democrats changed the voting laws in Virginia, like significantly uh, and so bad that a judge came back after the fact and said, yeah, you probably shouldn't have done it this way, but we're not going to change anything um, because the votes have already been cast. We had a thumb drive in Henrico County show up with 15,000 votes, right? Which they claimed uh, we have all the corresponding voter ID numbers. We, okay, fine. But what do you mean you mislabeled a, a thumb drive with 15,000 votes? Because you can vote up to 45 days before the election in Virginia. And so there's serious questions about chain of custody. There's serious mm-hmm. questions about potential data manipulation. And if they would have found the thumb drive had the results been different. Yeah. Well, and, and the and the issue, I, I had a reporter come and, and she was so furious after January 6th. And oh my gosh, I'm like, look, and she goes, do you really think there was voter fraud all over the place? And that guy said, I have never claimed that voter fraud cost me the election. All right. I've never claimed that. I said, but can I ask you a question? If instead on election night, I had been down and I had been down. Right, because I was leading in the I was leading in the uh, vote counts. If I had been down, and then all of a sudden a thumb drive showed up in the reddest county in the district with just enough votes to get me over, so I won. Would you have written an article about wow, we really need to change the whole chain of custody? Well, yeah, that probably would have been yeah, but you didn't, right? You you never do. This only works in one direction, and that's that's another reason why people are skeptical. Now, here's something interesting: single match deceased. What does that mean? Single match found deceased means the total number of verification requests where there is only one match in our records on name, date of birth, and last four digits of social security number, and the number holder is deceased. Why if we jump over to Texas, 4,571. Now, how is that anything other than than fraud? Yeah, okay, no, no, like no, hold fraud. on, hold on. So, somebody registered, put it in the mailbox, gawk, drop dead right there. Medical examiner says deceased by the time it made it yep. to SSA verification. They were like, ah, that person is listed as dead. Perhaps. I'm sorry. I just don't buy that. No. Occam's well, razor would suggest that people are filling out forms for dead people. And also, maybe that <laughs> happens, what, 10 times? Let's right, say. right. Yeah. 4,000? That seems like maybe too many. Well, yeah. and the, the other thing to keep in mind, too, is that they actively, like, like organizations actively go to you know retirement homes. They actively go to assisted living facilities. And they register people. Who, who may not be fully cognizant of what is actually yeah. going on. It is, it is strongly possible that, uh, because there, there was, there was something about, um, 
In 2020, a bunch of people on the right who, of course, were very concerned about the results were saying dead people voted. And they did. Do you know what happened? People were alive, voted, and then died. Mm -hmm. And then a month later, they were like, hey, this person voted early. And then it turns out they were actually dead. It's like, well, yeah, they were alive at the time and then died. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. But these numbers are very strange. Look, if you put Texas and Pennsylvania, because Pennsylvania, this thing is the next most uh, voter registration. You've got about six times more people voted registered in Texas than in Pennsylvania, six times. But a hu- 300 times more dead people. That's interesting. Yeah. So it's in six- Pennsylvania, only 16 came back from deceased register registrations from deceased that, people. And what that's, did I say? 10 is like what I would expect. Yeah, maybe yeah. people that, who, that, who that, yeah. that's a red flag anomaly. Those aren't supposed to that amount of deceased voter incomings is not. I'll just say right not now. No, normal. We don't know exactly what the data means. It's interesting. <clears throat> However, I would not be surprised if come November, they say Texas went blue. Mm hmm. I mean, this is what the people have been warning about for a long time. And I think because we think of Texas as the Wild West, they're always like, no, Texas will never go blue. Ha 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 ha. But Texas has changed a lot, right? Especially since 2016, especially since uh, COVID. I mean, there were a, a large number. I mean, I lived in Texas for a little while and I can't tell you how many people were like, oh, yeah, I just moved here from California. And that has only increased. I mean, we know that in the in the sphere that we work in, uh, people who are not necessarily from Texas saw Texas as a better place to live and went. I, I think of course, the the voting the voting results will reflect that. Uh, but again, the, the, these numbers don't necessarily reflect people changing. This this represents fraud. It, it looks like uh, Texas only reports every other week. Some mm-hmm. people are pointing out that if you go to the later next week, Texas isn't there. Well, they're not the previous week either. But the week ending March 9th, two hundred twenty four thousand attempts, and there were four thousand six hundred and fifty registrations for deceased people. Now, come on, like. So, so, so we're saying two thousand three hundred people, dead people per week. You, you want me to believe? Texas, are you okay? Every week, <laughs> two thousand three hundred people register and then croak before the Social Security Administration can verify their IDs. It's a strange and, thing. And not only do they die, but it gets reported by the coroner and the data uploaded so that the SSA has the updated information already. No BS. Yeah, it's weird. Someone is tr- is registering dead people. I wish that we could pull like this week from 2020, you know, and compare the data. Do you have that? Uh, because again, like the website, this, this website from the social security administration has that data. If you could do a side, side by side comparison of, of, this point in 2020 versus this point. Well, you, ending, probably, you probably 16th, want to choose like another like presidential year election yeah. to get like a fair 2020, 2020 March, right? March 21st, 2020. Yeah. Let's see if uh, Texas is on this list because they are oh, they also registering 4,000 dead people. 64,000. Zero dead people. Zero. Like, I'm, that's weird. <laughs> what, what's happening? Oh, man. What's you know what? You know what? Tim asking Zero. that question makes you a threat to democracy. Think, that's yeah, the real problem. Does. What, what's happening is I'm thinking a lot about change of uh, governments and how they want the civilians just keep doing what you do, civilian. You just have a new leader now. Don't even open your whoa, eyes. This whoa, is what, they want to change the databases and the paperwork to change who's in control without alerting. This is not an example of people voting different, in the, my opinion. The whole reporting. Totals, deceased, 244. Yeah. March, this is the week ending March, uh, uh, let's make sure we have the date right, March 21st, 2020. And for that for that week, there were 224 deceased registrations that turned out fr- to be from deceased people. Dude, this so is- let's go to March 16th, 2024. And the total now is 6,698. And 4,000, over 4,000 are from Texas alone. Like, <laughs> like- I, I think something is up. I, I can't say. It sounds like it's almost dangerous to register to vote in Texas. Like, it could yeah. cost you your life. Maybe, maybe. It's the leading cause of death leading in Texas. Cause maybe, of death maybe the paper they use is just a very fine, oh, like those sturdy, receipts. and rigid. Yeah, it's got the and film so on it. And so these poor elderly yeah. people are taking the thing, and they're filling it out. And then as they pick it up, it accidentally... The paper cuts their arm. Oh, That's probably more. You know? I thought you were going to say they're all dangerous. they're all laced with something, and so when they open them, you know, they they, they all die. Oh, it's the uh, it's the ink the the ink they use yeah. perhaps is or someone ink. is well, registering really... is trying to register uh, people of a list, and they don't know these people are dead already. Mm. Yep, there we go. Or there's a really specific serial killer at Hunt in Texas who only <laughs> oh, wants to go for after crazy. people who just like, register to vote. This is like yeah. alert the FBI. This is like in a the normal FBI society. Will be like, Stop talking about yeah, it. In the normal society, you're like we have this horrible horrific anomaly on our border right now of yeah. voter, people coming across and voter registrations going off the charts send in the fbi we need to know we need every aspect of this covered and taken so care of if we were to do um the total calculation from from 2011 till today because it allows you to pull that up 
we can see that for 55 million registrations, there are 1 million deceased. And that's the entire, the, like the, for, for, for uh, 13 years, mm-hmm. over 13 years. Now, I, I do want to point out this massive number right here of 367,000 in Texas, which is just absolutely fascinating. What the, for, for 13 years, there have been 367,000 registrations for dead people. Are people just coming absolutely across the wild. border yes. and registering as a dead person and then voting, casting their vote? Well, well, well thank, thank God we don't have any border say? issues with Texas. Thank God that's not right. an issue. Right yeah. Now. Oh, a state that's at, incredibly vulnerable to this type yeah. of fraud seems yeah. to have an issue. I, who could have forget, Missouri predicted? also has several thousand, which is crazy. Mm-hmm. Yeah. What the heck? Look at this for the for this doesn't even include uh, include Texas because they only report every other week. But seven thousand three hundred and forty five. But it's like in one. State. I wonder why from state, where it's not this, even listing it. That's interesting. Texas is not here because that number is bigger. What do you say, Nick? No, I'm just I'm just wondering why, because mo- most states have exactly what you do expect with this. But there's a couple states that stand out as anomalies. And, and that's strange. I mean, I wanted to bet on Texas and Missouri, Texas, maybe because Whoa. you have you have the legal immigration issue. No. Mm-hmm. But other um, states Texas, are in- Texas, again, this is this is February. Here's the date. February 17th. You know, take a look at this. Missouri had twenty three thousand. Yeah. Why Missouri? Yeah, why? On? Oh, 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 hold on. Hold on. Hold on. Let's just slow down right now. It is. It is. Okay, we got to be wrong about something. I'll just say this. For Media Matters, matches coming in from deceased people. So these are voter registrations where someone tried to register using a social security number and a name. And when it came back to the SSA, they said that person is dead. In Missouri, in one week, 23,253. Are you still on the 13 13 years? February 17th, 2024. One week. It was like a a third of the registrations came back dead people. Yeah. That's Is this 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 them purging the rolls? No, this is uh, help America vote verification transactions by state. And so, uh, look, maybe we're completely wrong, but it says this single match found alive. The total number of verification requests where there's only one match in our records of a name, last four digits of the SSN, date of birth and the number holders alive. They say total matches, the total number of verification requests. So someone is, is, is registering the vote and asking to verify the social and the socials and the name. Look at this single match found deceased. The total number of verification requests where there's only one match in our records on a name, date of birth, and last for the social and the number holders deceased. This is strange. How does how does 23,000 verification requests not strike them as odd in one week? Yeah, what, 76,000 total, 26,000 of them came back dead. I, I can't see the numbers exactly from here. 23,000 came back dead. That's so ridiculous. That is. So you're thinking they purge voter rolls from time to time? I, well, I'm trying to make sense of this, right? Because that would I'm, make sense for a huge. Yeah, number. it would make sense for a huge thing if a state came by and they said, "Okay, we're we're reevaluating our voter rolls, and, and right. we've identified all these people are dead, and so we're we're purging." We want to verify the these. Yeah, as opposed to like new voter registration. Um, and 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 I would expect states like Missouri and Texas to actually take that a little bit more seriously. Um, so if, if I'm if I'm trying to come up with a non nefarious explanation for those numbers, that's all I can think of. Otherwise, it's shady as hell. <laughs> it's just weird. It yeah. doesn't it doesn't make sense. And I again, like I said, it I think is, you have to be right on that. I think it has to be that, that. Yeah, it can't. I mean, hopefully, because otherwise we live in a very corrupt system. And I yeah. think that's not great. Yeah. It's a very depressing thing well, to talk and, about and on Ian's can, birthday. Can I say another thing that just irritates me about this is and this is one of the problems with you know bureaucracies in general. Is that even when something like this is done, and let's say let's say that the explanation I just offered is the actual explanation, and actually this is something that we would agree with, right? A state did the right thing. They looked at their voter numbers. They said, yeah, hey, we had a whole bunch of people on the voter rolls that need to be removed because of deaths, et cetera. Then put that on there, right? Mm-hmm. Like make that obvious that that's what you're doing. Like this is why the transparency aspect of all of this is so important is because even when a bureaucracy is doing something that you might approve of, They still don't do it in such a way to where people can actually understand what's going on. But again, we haven't verified that that's what's gone on here. (laughs) It looks like that may be the case. Okay. The reason. And so I just want to point out we're we're looking into the high number of deceased and we're shocked to see it in the immediate. But it may very well be the state is saying 
let's run these registrations and see if these people are still around and alive. Make sure that their date of birth, name and everything comes up. Mm -hmm. But it, maybe it is perfect. Can a state do that legally? Run your your data and register, try and register. Oh, it, you can, to it vote? can run its own rolls, right? Yeah, it, it's supposed to. Le legally, what states are supposed to do is look at the voter rolls and, and evaluate them in order to determine that if, if people have died, they fall off the voter rolls. So somebody can't, because here's what ends up happening, right? You, you die, but you're on a permanent absentee list. Well, now that absentee shows up to your home and somebody fills that out and sends it off. Well, that's voter fraud. And so that's why you try to keep those roles updated. It's why there's also supposed to be, you know, you have organizations like Epic, which I think is a, a problematic group, but it's also supposed to allow states to communicate better among themselves so that when somebody moves, you don't have absentees going to like two locations. But like I said before, with same day voter registration, now you've got a place, look, look at a, a university campus, right? So you don't, you don't live in Virginia, but you go to school at, you know, whatever, I, UVA. I, 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 I think we're actually wrong. I, let me read this. What is HAVA? Do, the Help America Vote Act requires states to verify the information of newly registered voters, newly That's registered voters for federal now. elections. Each state must establish a computerized statewide voter registration list and verify new voter information. Then that's, the that's states are required thing. to verify the driver's license number against a state MVA database only in situations where no driver's license exists. Should the states verify the last four digits of the new voter registration social security number, the state submits the last digits of the SSN to the MVA for verification with SSA. In addition, SSA is required to report whether its records indicate the registrant, registrant is deceased. These are new registrations. Yeah, that's a hey, we gave we gave the benefit of the doubt, right? We didn't rush to a conclusion, but that sounds bad. Okay, yeah. I mean, it says uh, states must submit a request for us. Uh, uh, states must only submit a request to us for new voters who n do not present a valor valid driver's license during the voter registration process. Straight up, these are new registrations yeah. where they're saying someone did not present an ID and Missouri kicked back 23,000 of them as deceased. Yeah. That's Yo, nice. I wonder if Missouri is a hotbed for illegal immigration. I just feel like right? I, have, think it I, is. I feel like even though I'm reading this from the SSA website, it has to be wrong. There's no way that's true. Twenty three thousand deceased new registrants out of sixty eight thousand total. Yeah, that's a third. That's just like throwing it at the wall and seeing what sticks. Yeah. In Missouri, though. What is going Some on? Some random state in the middle of the country. They're trying to keep it subtle. If it was in California, it'd be a red flag. They did it in oh, Texas because so it's unstoppable. Isn't there a it does not say this is being used for voter roll. It says they're required for newly registered voters for federal elections. That, that's nuts. Somebody, someone either screwed up their, their data input on an Excel spreadsheet somewhere, or that's suspicious as hell. Maybe maybe the newly is a typo in it to just say of registered voters. I don't think so. No, these are it's Because the states are required to verify the driver's license against the a database. What is uh, H? It says already right here. States must only submit a request to us for new voters who do not present a valid driver's license during the voter registration process. That is... All of these that are being sent to the Social Security Administration are purported to be new registrations. That's nuts. <laughs> Dude, That it's the deceased thing that I just look. I, I don't know. We're just sitting here. We're reading a web, we're reading a web, reading a website. Y'all figure it out. Well, how do you yeah. get the data of 23,000 dead people to even register them? You've got to find that data somewhere. You can't accidentally write it down on act like oops. Mis misclicked 23 and probably they all didn't the time. just drop dead that week yeah so <laughs> probably would have heard about it <laughs> my, i think my, was there a mass casualty event in missouri we missed <laughs> i don't think so like a car a, my, my, i heard about this phenomenon where carbon dioxide can build up at the bottom of the lake oh yeah and then it bursts and sweeps over the neighboring town asphyxiating everybody could that have happened Holy somewhere gosh. and we just didn't know it happened that's well that's what media matters will want us to assume before we <laughs> before we make any other conclusions yeah. or or it could be that despite the fact that they say this on their website it's not true that's that's, that's the point. also true i so, want to not what, believe this data does that but mean it's stark yeah i was gonna say is what's true better or worse because Twenty three thousand is not great. well. The, the thing, the thing that again, the 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 reason why it's also confusing is because you you would expect if there was if somebody is doing this right and they're actually good at it, you're not going to one state and doing all of this. But but again, I I am <laughs> I've seen plenty of incompetence in politics, and so I, I nothing really surprises me anymore. Is Missouri like a big swing state? No. No. Is it, what is yeah, it? But my thought vote. is like, I keep saying this. I think I could be totally wrong. Missouri, I'm not super familiar with you, but I think it's a 
pretty substantial agricultural state. And yeah. often you have undocumented H- illegal visas, aliens, right? Yeah. People who are there illegally working on farms or whatever else. So theoretically, there could be a population that would want to register to vote that doesn't have a social security number. Hypothetically, I'm just uh, running a theory. These are numbers from last week. Is that right? Or, or these earlier in the year? Like, we, so, so this 23,000 number is for the week ending February 17th. For one week. For one one we- week. One week. I can jump I can jump back to February 10th. Yeah, yeah. And take a look at Missouri. See if there's any other t- 20,000 dead. 251. Mm. Oh. Which okay, if a like what county ran on? their rolls that week and was purging, that would sure. a big number would make sense to me, but like But that's not what the that's website says. That's not what the website says. Yeah. So what about go one week before this one too and look at Missouri again? This the, let's it, go to February third. This is a fun game. Yeah, I love for this, <laughs> how many dead? No, nah, the Missouri. The Missouri anomaly is insane. It was twenty six thousand, twenty three thousand, and three weeks later, two weeks yeah. after this, yep. that's that's something wrong. Something big is going on. And I mean, Texas only. Let, let's let's jump to another week. Uh, let's go to uh, February. Let's go to January twenty seventh. Do we have Texas here on January 27th? Because here we go. 4,607. 125,000 requests. This website says these are literally new registrations. How is it possible that so many dead people, the tune of thousands, are submitting new registrations? Well, and if there's like, if there's a portion of them, let's say, or like, yeah, if you write your social security number wrong and it turns out that the number you got was a dead person, like- it would it just would have happened 4,000 times, no. right? Because it would have to match their name, too. They're, in 23,000 in one week in Missouri, someone accidentally added a zero or something. Even 2,000 is a lot. Yeah. Compared to their, to, their, to their other numbers. And it's the same week that it happened in Texas. But, I've, but, but guys, the important thing to understand is no one will investigate this. Not a single Republican will ask about it. And everyone will forget within one month. What are you talking about? This, these numbers? Let, it, let them not forget. This is insane. This is and this is just a drop in the bucket of what's to come if we don't start making noise about this kind of thing. Well, Serge just sent me some massive breaking news. So uh, I don't the know. Are earthquake people, in Taiwan. Yeah, seven point five in Taiwan. Yeah. Oh, wow. So so China has basically launched their earthquake weapon. And this is <laughs> I'm just kidding. Oh. But let's uh, let's see if we can pull this one up. Get the breaking news because there's a tsunami warning going on right now. Let's see what. Uh, here we go. Breaking news here on Timcast. What do we have here? We've got uh, Forex Live earthquake near Taiwan magnitude 7.5 felt in Taipei. Japan impacted also tsunami alert issued. I hope everybody Jeez. is okay. I hope there's not going to be a tsunami. Evacuation advisory issued to Okinawa coastal areas in Japan. Okinawa encompasses the island chain south of west, J- west of Japan's main islands. Tsunami alert issued up to three meters high. Holy crap. Power outages reported in areas of Taipei. Well, you know, the scary thing is if there was a time to actually storm Taiwan, it would be now. After or a natural disaster of some sort. Right, right. away. I mean, it, yeah, it, it's going to disable defensive capabilities. Yeah, when Taiwan China is China just doesn't have the capability. To just, take a take Taiwan? I don't think so. I, I, why they, not? So they've got, a, when you look at it, if you judge militaries by the Excel spreadsheet, right? Like the number of tanks, the number of men, the number of whatever, China's military looks incredibly powerful. The problem is, is that they run into major logistical issues when you're trying to to pull off a major amphibious campaign, because Taiwan has about 150, 190,000 people in their active duty military. They have 2 million reserves, right? And and that terrain is not the easiest to fight. So now you're going to have to, you're going to have to cross a hundred miles yep. of open ocean, Right, which you're you're not going to be able to just do that. And now, how many troops do you have to actually send over to establish a beachhead? And then you have to supply a logistical train across a hundred miles of open ocean. Yep. I mean, this is a nightmare. And, and the Chinese military, I'm sorry, two million active duty personnel. Okay, you think that's all Class A divisions? No, there, there's a lot of like conscript troops in there that aren't very good, that are not capable of of conducting a complex amphibious operation. Then, in order to pull it all off, you have to maintain complete air superiority in order to protect your supply lines, um, unless you're going to be able to move in and do it. And by the way, the the Taiwanese are going to fight, right? I, they're not rolling over on this. And so with minimal U.S. support, minimal U.S. support, air and naval, no ground troops, China cannot sustain that invasion. I just, I don't buy it. I don't buy it. Not to mention the fact with the currents and everything else, you got to attack at certain times of the year. Otherwise, it becomes even more difficult. It is kind of funny that Taiwan is actually China. Yeah. But we call it Taiwan, even though it's actually China. Yeah, Republic of. The, 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 the original, original. Yeah. Yeah. The OG the government. Get it. <laughs> yeah. The Grand Republic of China. Yeah. Let it rain once again. 
Yeah, I mean, I agree as well. And from an economic standpoint with China, they're like, they're not in any state to be funding a war, let alone like making the stuff to have a war. It's not really in their best interest if, right now. If Taiwan was like on the border of, of China, I'd be a lot more worried about it because the logistical concept here is is very, very different. But it, 100 miles of open ocean to launch an amphibious operation yeah. and sustain it is not easy. And I, I don't even think it would be it would be Chinese if it was on the mainland already. Yeah. The only reason oh, yeah. those islands are not. You know, yeah. we got uh, four days until that eclipse that everyone's freaking out about. Oh, really? Half jokingly freaking out about, I guess. <laughs> yeah. The NASA's firing the APEP rockets at, you know, what APEP means, right? No. The God of uh, Egyptian God of chaos that chases the sun, the oh. snake. So they did it on purpose naming yeah. it that. But there's all these wild conspiracy theories. And then we get a 7.5 magnitude earthquake off of Taiwan. They're flipping CERN on. (laughs) Yeah, Yeah, they're flipping CERN on. Dude, the conspiracy conspiracy, uh, acts must be lighting up like crazy. Uh, I I imagine at the level of government you're at, you're not with the cultists, like the crazy, like esoteric, you know, people that are like blood mad. But do you, are there whiffs of this this occult in the government or are you kind of at the stage where it's not? One of the beautiful things about being in a citizen legislature is, is so most people don't know this. Like most of your state legislatures are not full time legislatures. We go down there like sixty days during even years, forty five days during odd years. We'll hear two thousand bills within that time frame, and then we go home. We live in our districts. We only get like in Virginia seventeen thousand six hundred dollars a year, roughly. That's your salary, right? It is not supposed to be your life, your career. You go down there, you do the people's business, you go back to your district, you hand your constituent services. That's it. Forty six out of fifty state legislatures. That's the reality. When people talk about term limits, I'm like, I. Not term limits. I want Congress to be a citizen legislature because you don't want to pay politicians, you know, full time to do it. But what right. it means, though, is we focus on what we're doing for that period of time and then we get back home. Um, but this is people that have way too much time. That oh, my just God. Dawdling around for you, years. You're, if you're going to pay politicians to do nothing but sit around and dream crap up, they're going to dream up some pretty stupid crap. Right. That's got to be, I think about like the kings of old, the, all the Illuminati, all these ancient or super, I just saw a video of the the, the most valuable uh, house on earth. It's a billion dollar home and some, I don't Where know, guy, it? I didn't get that. I don't know. It's, it's a like, two bedroom apartment in San Francisco. Yeah, can you imagine? <laughs> and like during COVID, the guy was so bored. He that built this underground hallway. grotto, yeah. like these people with so much money that they can do and build almost anything. Yeah within reason um then they start to dream up crazy then you get into like actual god and spirituality and the occult and all that stuff and you're like whoa now i've got enough time to focus on it i, I don't know do you do you get into it like i'm well, like, get into it that's kind of weird because i kind of think as religion as a kind of kind of, kind of the occult like i think of god and spirituality and all that is a form of occult occultism but it's well, just a I modern mean, I, accepted occultism we call i, I think religion. there's differentiate like i'm a christian um, and, and so I think there's a differentiation between that and what, what is generally associated with the occult, you know, but, um, yeah, but I don't know. I, I think that, I, I think some of the stuff, when you look at like Gnosticism and some of the mysticism that, that comes up and, and yeah, some of it is, some of it is rich guys with too much money and too much time on their hands. But the, I think a lot of the universe is more magnetic than we realize. And, and so a lot of these patterns play out. Um, like getting hit by comets that are like magnetically trapped in orbit, our moon eclipsing the sun in just the right proportion where it blocks the entire thing out, held magnetically in position. So behavior, you know, our brains are magnetic. Um, they have these neural pathways and stuff. And I wonder if like there is something going on. There's the reason, because like Tim kind of brought up jokingly, like mm-hmm. April 8th, they're firing these APOP, yeah. APEP rockets, CERN's firing on, we got our uh, uh, earthquake. Could be coincidence. I don't really believe in coincidence. I'm just anymore. checking videos while you guys are talking, just so you know what I'm doing. Yeah. I'm looking at all the breaking footage, seeing if there's. It, it, it actually, phenomenon. it actually is kind of really interesting phenomenon that we are the only planet. I, I believe the only planet within our, certainly within our solar system, but I think it's it's broader than that. That that is actually in a position to be able to have a full eclipse, um, and and it, it, it's an interesting it, it it's an again an interesting phenomenon that the one planet that actually has people that can observe an eclipse is the one planet that actually has the sort of uh, Where the, full lunar eclipses. The moon is the exact right size yes. for its distance to the sun so that it creates the eclipse. Yeah. yeah it's held That's in the crazy. Lagrange point between it's the earth crazy. and the sun probably where like yeah. the sun and the earth are pulling on it at well, equal it, magnitude. It, and, and it also it, like that, that phenomenon has also made it possible to, to recognize other scientific phenomenon when they looked at things like with, again, with respect to the theory of relativity and whatnot, like where if, if we weren't in our special position within the solar system, we, we wouldn't be able to do it. It's, it's, it's an interesting thing. Some people use it from like a design 
concept other people think you know someone just mentioned in super chat don't forget the dual emergent cicada is a 221 yeah. year occurrence yeah, yeah. So that, is that like the locust plague? We it, have darkness. Yeah. What are the, darkness, what are the plagues? Darkness, locusts, uh, river turns to blood, uh, death of uh, firstborn, measles, frogs. Whoa, we have measles yeah. in Chicago. Yeah. 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 <laughs> How many plagues are we having? Oh, we, we had, we had, we had bubonic plague in Oregon. That, wow. Uh, yeah, wow. Yeah. River turns to blood? How much yeah. you want to bet some, we're going to get some kind of, like something bad's going to happen on the border? Mm. Rio Rio there could be, or like yeah, iron maybe. there could be like an iron explosion into the into the water we're just going to do all four horsemen at once <laughs> they'll do <laughs> the earth will fertilize itself with iron from time yeah. to time and it just spurt like iron yeah. water into the yeah. rivers and turn them red but the uh the killing of the firstborn i think a lot about sterilizing children when yeah. we're talking about that and how people what they're doing to their children at the children's behest and like is that meeting some sort of biblical prophecy of destroying your firstborn i i think it's it it, it is fascinating um it it is it is fascinating when people make parallels between when when you look at like ancient you know ball worship and and whatnot it was the idea of of child sacrifice for fertility or for agricultural purposes or whatnot I mean the Carthaginians were doing this like um, at the same time that you know you know they were fighting the Punic Wars but um, yeah it, it 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 is a it is amazing it, it is amazing and absolutely horrific what we are allowing to happen to children. Um, in the name of a form of kind of self-worship mm -hmm. that is just, you, you would have thought it unthinkable 20 years ago. Man, the stuff that's been going on. And uh, I saw this tweet. They said uh, the, the hour is later than you think. Mm. Like the Biden administration is actively engaging in communist policies, going after their political rivals. The position that we are in right now in this country, it's just, I believe anything probably. I, I think, you know, the more I read of like Antonio Gramsci um, and, and the whole concept of uh, the reason why Marx got it wrong is because Marx thought it was economics and, and Gramsci came to the conclusion sitting in a, in a prison in Italy in the you know thirties that, well, no, you, you have to set up a, a complete counter culture. And that became known as the March through the institutions. He didn't coin that term, but it came. And if you, and if you look at it, I think a lot of people want to believe that there was some sort of secret force out there, whether it was the KGB or whatnot, that was manipulating. All. And yeah, you had things like active measures that you know Yuri Bezmenov talks about and whatnot. But more than that, you just have a lot of people that like the explanation Karl Marx gave for everything that ails them. And it got really popular in Hollywood. It got really popular in higher ed. And now we shouldn't be surprised that it's filtered down to the rest of society. I'm going to jump to this story from uh, the New York Post. Trump hits Biden for border bloodbath, says president allowed monster who killed Ruby Garcia back into the United States. What's going on on the border is it's a crime against humanity. There are atrocities happening where human smugglers are raping small children and delivering them into sex slavery. Customs and border protection with taxpayer dollars with smiles on their faces are taking these children, admittedly saying outright in an interview with Dr. Phil, they know. That in, in, in most of these instances, or let's just say many, that they are delivering children into sex slavery and to sweatshops, and they do it anyway. So we were just talking about the previous segment with uh, there's an earthquake earthquake in, in uh, Taiwan, near off Taiwan, got the eclipse coming, APEP rockets. Now we've got the cicadas coming out. And I'm just like, how many plagues are we at? And, and talking about that had me really just think like, was the was the was the great battle of good and evil going to be something magical or was it just going to be of of this world? I mean, is it supposed to be that demons emerge from the from the cracks in the ground and agents come down? Or is it going to be that we as humans on this earth witness the most demonic and evil actions you could imagine and nothing is done about it? I think it's I mean, I think that's what's tragic about um evil forces in the world, right? Like they are very often happening in front of your face and there it's not that there's going to be some big, you know, Marvel movie like effect. It's that you see terrible things happen every day and become conditioned to adjust to them. And I think about um, you know, Catholic Catholic churches say the um, prayer to St. Michael the Archangel. And there's a line in it that talks about um, and those who proudly are seeking the ruin of souls. And I I feel like that is what we have 
sort of let ourselves dr drift into being used to, right? And we say, let, let live and let live, or we just become accustomed a cer to a certain level of um, instability and violence. And ultimately, we are watching good and evil battle every day, except we're sort of numb and blind to it. I, I can, I personalize that, like hearing someone, a woman getting beaten in the house next to mine. And like, I'm, I'm pretty liberal. I'm pretty hands off with like, take care of your, 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 you and your own and I'll take care of me and mine. But at some point I had to intervene and call the cops because the guy was probably going to kill the girl. Same thing with like watching genocide happen in a country. Like it's like, look away, man, and just wait for it to be done. I can't, but I mean, what can, what can we do? What can you really do when, when the powers that be are in control of the genocide and they want to do it? And I think it's, it's, I'm not, I'm not always so concerned about the powers that be. The issue is we as humans. Like that we, the people of the United States, tolerate and allow Customs and Border Protection to traffic children into sex slavery. Donald Trump can hit at Joe Biden for it all day and night, but Joe Biden's policies, Mayorkas's policies are meaningless without the men and women wearing those badges with smiles on their faces saying the paycheck is worth transporting children into sex slavery. I, th th this I just can't get over it. Donald Trump's calling it the border bloodbath. It's brilliant, uh, brilliant branding. This is what people were saying when they started attacking Trump for bloodbath. Trump adopted it and is pushing it back on Biden. And I can respect that, um, you know, we, we want to see this through to, to, to November because things are looking good, despite the fact of whatever those voter registration things we were looking at were. But it is shocking to me that there are human beings in CBP that don't care and they'll just do it. And I suppose I, I shouldn't be surprised. I don't know. People think, like to think that Americans are better and perhaps many of them, you know, Americans per capita are better people when it comes to individual responsibility, personal freedoms and uh, our core values. But you look at the history of this planet and you will see every time there is some kind of authoritarian takeover. I don't care if it's Nazi Germany or the Spanish Civil War or Russia or whatever it may be. There are people who are willing to commit acts of evil to protect themselves. I also, here's what I think. There was a book called uh, Ordinary Men yeah. that was talking about various SS groups and ISOTs and groups and whatnot within the, the Nazis. And and that is, that is of course, everyone's kind of favorite one to reference. But one of the things they talked about is that, and, and Jordan Peterson talks about this a lot, where it's this idea that we have this idea, well, that was somebody else. That was over there. There was something wrong with them. They were psychopaths. They were the, like, no, 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 they weren't. They were ordinary people. Like if, if you were not, if you were not cognizant of your own individual capacity for evil, then you're not going to actually do the correct things that you need to do in order to combat against that. The other thing that I think is important is the greatest evil is not, people have this idea, and this is kind of a leftist trope, that the greatest evil is perpetrated for the quest for power or the quest for greed or the quest for wealth. No, it isn't. The greatest evils are, are always a result of somebody that honestly believes that they're doing something for the greater good. And, and C.S. Lewis had this quote once, I'm going to butcher it, I'm not going to get it totally right, but C.S. Lewis had this quote where he was basically saying it would be better to be ruled by you know greedy robber barons than yep. it would by moral busybodies. And, and his whole idea was is that the moral busybodies will torment you without end because they do so with the approval of their own conscience. And there's nothing more dangerous than somebody that honestly believes that I have to, I have to do this to you for your own good, or I have to do this to this other person for the greater good. And that's what's really terrifying. It's it, the, the person that's greedy or the person that's just quest for power, they can get a little power, they can get a little money, and they might be okay for a while. But my gosh, be 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 leery of the the moral busybody that is it's, doing all of this to save the world. There's also another component of it, which uh, we talk about quite a bit, and that is these CBP officers took a deal with the devil. The assumption most people make when they hear about the Faustian deal is you get offered your greatest desires. You want to be a rock star? You want to be an astronaut? You want to be famous? You want to be rich and successful and everyone will love you? Then cut the deal with the devil. The reality is it's much simpler than that. The devil shows up when your child is hungry and says, serve the army of evil and your child will know nothing but a full belly. But the devil will say, serve the army of good and you'll you'll be fed and you'll be wealthy. No. And you'll be like, how, how is any of this wrong? All I've got to do is destroy the, the roaches over no, there. No, no. That's the scary thing is that these CBP agents know when they take that child, the number on their arm, they are selling a child into sex slavery. And you ask yourself, for what? For what is it worth? Your thousand dollar paycheck? 
must be. And the guy saying to himself, I got kids, man. I would th these CBP agents would rather transport an innocent child to sex slavers than see their own children go hungry. That is the deal with the devil. I, I, I don't understand how we're months into this story being true and we still have people working for CBP. It's insane. Maybe many of them quit. I have no idea. We, we've heard so many stories about good cops quitting. We had a couple cops on the culture war who talked about how they got pushed out because they were good cops refusing. One guy said they tried to get him to write up a fake warrant. And he says, no, they boot him out. Mm -hmm. You don't play the game. You don't do the evil deed. You're not you're, you're out. And it's no surprise we have so many bad cops. The, uh, one of the cops we had on here, this guy, Chris, said that leftists fabricated racist posts. And, it, and, and, and the mayor just said, you're all fired. Don't care. Yeah. Literally don't care. How is it that there could be a person right now wearing a CBP badge knowing what they're doing? I have, I have honestly no idea. I, I think, well, I'll take a crack at that. Um, if you are, if you are a CBP agent and you're nowhere near this, this component, right? Because not everybody in CBP is doing the same job. And you're in a BORTAC unit, right? Or you're doing something like that where you're going out there and you do your job and you think you're doing it well. And you may be frustrated with somebody else and what they're doing in the organization or the agency, but you're still going to do your job. And because you could say the same thing about the military, you could say the same thing about, you know, any, any sort of large metropolitan police department. I get where you're coming from because it's the idea of at what point does it taint you just being associated with the organization? And, and at what point, by the same token, you can, you can see someone rationally making the argument that if, if, if the good guys aren't doing the job, then the only thing that's left are the bad guys. And, and that's the part where, you know, my, my dad was LAPD for 20 years and, um, he got out in, uh, 2000, I think, uh, had a, had a, a massive stroke on the job and had to medically retire. I remember getting, I remember wanting to get out of the military at that point. This was, you know, I, I'd only been a couple of years, like 98 and, um, to, to 2000. And I was getting out cause I didn't like being in a peacetime army and it was boring. And, and I was going to go be LAPD and he goes, don't do it. And, and he saw some of the changes that were happening in the department. And one of the things he told me he goes, Nick, people get the police they ask for. And right now they are asking for a police department that wants to show up and write reports after you're hurt. Because if you try to show up and intervene, you're going to potentially lose your job. You're going to, you're you, again, your, your kids, you know, how are you going to pay your bills? How are you going to pay your mortgage? Um, and, and there's something to that, right? You, you will, the institutions that you, we, we have this idea and I really do think that we've grown up in, in some degree, I hate to use the word privilege because it's been, you know, co-opted, but there's, there's a certain degree of complacency that comes with the sort of relative wealth, prosperity, security that we experience within the United States. And, and you have people that grow up thinking that this is just the way it's supposed to be. This is the natural order of things. This is about as far from the natural order of things in human history as anything. And then you have people that think that they can just throw out the, uh, the underlying objective morality or the underlying objective philosophies, which made these things, the prosperity and the security possible. And you can just kind of pick and choose like a buffet. And then you end up with something like this, where you've got people celebrating what's going on on the border right now, because they honestly think it's a representation of tolerance. Yeah. And it's nuts. It's like, this is, this is not just good. And again, someone sees me saying like, oh yeah, he's a white dude. Of course he's a bigot. Yeah, I am worried about a bunch of people just flooding into the country because if you don't actually have sovereign borders, that's pretty damn problematic. But I'll tell you what I'm also worried about. I'm worried about some parent in, you know, Ecuador that when they saw the DACA regulations go into place, they thought to themselves, oh my gosh, I can give my kids a better future. Well, how do you facilitate that? Do you go to a travel agent and just book a flight for your kid? No. You work with the legal organizations, you work with cartels because they're the only ones that control border access. And you're trying to do the right thing by your kid. And now your kid's sold into sex slavery because we had a policy in the United States that really sounded good on paper, but that's what it produces in reality. And then when you show them the reality, it doesn't matter because the ideological train has already left the station and it ain't coming back. Mm -hmm. You've lured everyone into a dangerous situation, yes. right? You've put American citizens at risk because we're not enforcing border policies and we're potentially exposing their communities to more crime than they actually need to be exposed to. Yes. And you're also hurting children who are sent away with no one to advocate for them. In fact, anyone along the journey could say, hey, you're vulnerable and I'm going to take advantage of that. Oh, absolutely. That We know they do it. We know they we know do they it. know they do it. Yeah. Yeah. I think but, it always oh, say. I was just going to say, but they say, oh, but they're fleeing something. This is better for them, right? Like, yeah. how can the Biden administration say, knowing that this even happens to one child, that this is a policy worth enforcing? Well, they've incentivized it. Like, they've incentivized this behavior. 
It's not just that they allow it. They incentivize it. Mm-hmm. Yeah, when Kamala Harris said "come," uh, or they were like "come, come to the United States," I think they claimed they made a, a proclamation. And no, she said, "Don't come." Yeah. She then don't later, come. she said, "Don't come." Yeah. But when first, she was they running. were saying "come." Yeah. Right. And uh, that was disappointing. But with this privilege thing you're talking about, I feel it. Like I'm in a land of peace. Mm-hmm. I'm like, oh yeah, I want to be nice to everyone. I don't want to hurt anything. I don't want to kill that that invading species. I don't want to. I'm talking about animals, like yeah. like uh, well, humans are animals too, but like raccoons and shit. Like I don't want to kill it, but like. That's my privilege. I don't have to. I have walls. I don't have to go kill the bear because I have walls to protect me. Right. And this is what you got with like. So you're saying build the wall. 40 feet tall. Everyone should have walls, <laughs> access to walls. Look, good fences make good neighbors. I think that's yeah. a good thing. I mean, but this is what we saw with, with especially, I think of like East Coast uh, cities that were like, no, no, the border should be open. You should let them in. We should all be sanctuary cities. And then once the brunt of illegal immigration hit them, think about New York City. They were yeah. like federal government we we need support i mean the governor the mayor they have asked for support and the biden administration has said no and they are suffering the consequences in fact they're trying to hoist the 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 effects of this onto neighboring counties around them but you know, when but, it when it didn't affect them it was okay if it happened to border communities in texas and arizona but when it started to affect them someone had to step in but you, you notice even then right it wasn't like oh gosh now we're suffering the consequences of our actions maybe we should reconsider our policies no it was hey federal government give us more mm-hmm. stuff Right. It, it's never let's reconsider the policies and, and approve work permits faster. Yeah. Yeah. You know, you, make it easier for someone to stay here. Don't even consider deportation Yeah, for the cities taking them in. They were instead of saying, hey, change the policy. So the stops happening. they were like, give us money to facilitate. it. Yes. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Or they were going to their own citizens and saying, sorry, your kids can't show up to school today because we've got to house people that are here illegally, which is yeah. like kind of a Third Amendment violation. So you sorry, can, homeless people who are here. That. There's no space in the shelter for you anymore. Yeah. yeah. Or your businesses are being shut down to facilitate illegals. That doesn't make any sense. Mm-hmm. And that, that seems like a constitutional violation. I, d- I don't see how there is a country. Like, you know, the polls are looking really great for Donald Trump with RFK Jr. running. We'll see. But even then, it's going to be a a challenge if Trump wins and Republicans take the Senate, uh, the Congress, and they they do have to a certain degree the Supreme Court. There's still going to be massive backlash. Michael Malice pointed this out. He said, don't you think if Donald Trump were to win and try to enact this deportation that California and New York's governors would mobilize their National Guard and say no? I don't know that they would go that far. I think they would, I, I think in a more subtle ways, they would resist it and they would do enough to actually make it very, very difficult to the de- de- the deportation piece. The the other, the biggest thing I'm worried about is the federal bureaucracy because people have, people think that when the president gets in there, he can just fire, well, you can fire people in the executive branch, right? You're the chief executive. No, you can't, right? There's, there's a really, there's a relatively small number of people that you can actually get rid of. And you're right. You're going to have states that actually resist that some more subtly, some more overtly. Um, but it, if, if we can't do something to tackle the massive federal bureaucracy in the same kind of way that Javier Malay is doing in Argentina right, right now, if you can't do that, forget it. The bureaucracy will wait and they can, they can last out four years of Trump. Right, they can slow roll stuff. You're saying Millet has the president in Argentina has way more power over, over the that. executive branch. Yeah. So he was able to cut what? 13, uh, 14. Afuera. He just <laughs> cut 14 government agencies of 23. Down it to just nine. got rid of, just got rid of On 22 two. to nine ministries. Like you're, you're gone now. 70,000 government employees were Afuera. firing you. That's, yeah. That's the value of small governments, man. You can move real quick. Big governments become real untenable. That's well, that's why you the need thing, decentralization. Though, Argentina had a massive one. The difference was is that their their chief executive has more control over the executive branch than our president has over the executive branch. That's what it comes down to. I, let's I let's let's jump to this story from the Washington Post. RFK Jr. argues Biden is bigger threat to democracy than Trump, drawing criticism. I love this uh, sub subtitle. Uh, Several experts and historians rebuked the independent presidential candidate for his comments in a televised interview. Basically, what he said was uh, Joe Biden's going after his political opponents with criminal charges and censoring people on social media, violating the First Amendment, which is the first. And of course, uniparty establishment, corporate press media rushes out to write stories in a way. This is the, this is the secret. This story should not be written this way. Drawing criticism. We had over on uh, when, so TimCast.com no longer has news. Uh, now the uh, former Timcast team is now working with SCNR.com, a separate company. And when Timcast was being evaluated by NewsGuard, we ran a story that said something like Donald Trump says X. And then it was Donald Trump at a rally today said, said the following, and it was like a paragraph 
Trump says that when this happens, he will do this. NewsGuard asks us why we didn't fact check Donald Trump. And I said, because we're just reporting on a quote. We're not running a fact check. We're just saying Trump at a rally said he would do this thing. And they said, yeah, but the thing he was talking about was wrong. And I'm like, well, I don't know. I'm just telling people it's what he said. So they said, okay, you're fake news. <laughs> they yeah. gave us they gave us a strike because we didn't fact check when we were reporting on a quote. But our reporting was 100% accurate. 100% accurate. He really did say that. Yeah. Right. Yeah. And so when you take a look at the Washington Post, look at how they do this. Mm -hmm. The story should be RFK Jr. argues Biden is a bigger threat to democracy than Donald Trump. That's it. Yeah. Drawing criticism. Why? Why write a story and publish it and include your own editorial context? Because they're framing the narrative. They want to make sure that people like Ian's mom, for instance, before she actually hears yep. what RFK Jr. had to say, she gets slammed by MSNBC, CNN, Washington Post saying, yes, he said it, but he's wrong. Here's why he's wrong. Yeah, this will make a reader, your average reader, fire cortisol. They'll be like, OK, I'm getting ready for conflict. Let's find out what this criticism, this bad, bad news is. And then you go into the article reading with that kind of yeah. state of mind. RFK Jr., of course, is completely correct, though he did say Trump trying to overthrow the election clearly is a threat to democracy. But the question was, who is a worse threat? And what I would say is I'm not going to answer that, but I can argue Biden is. So they're saying he said it, Biden was well, he said he could argue that he was, meaning he wasn't sure, but there are certainly arguments to be made. Here you go. And then they bring up a Harvard University political scientist and co-author of How Democracies Die. Yeah. Said of Kennedy's comment, it's a preposterous claim to be a politician committed to democracy. There are two cardinal rules. One must accept election outcomes, win or lose. One must not threaten or use violence to gain power. Donald Trump has clearly violated both rules, while President Biden never has. But it's he just claimed that he could argue Biden is worse. Like, well, that's not Biden possible. is using violence to gain power. It's called the federal government going after Trump, Trump's lawyers and other uh, Trump supporters. That's violence. This this is why I, I love um, what was the Thomas Sowell quote. He's like the, the the single greatest thing about getting a degree from Harvard is no longer being impressed by anybody that has a degree from Harvard. There you go. Um, and and it's and it's for stuff like this. And and it's and it's always an idea of how they how they categorize violence. It's like whenever I speak to whenever I get invited to speak to students, I always ask them this first question: I'm like, what is the one thing thing that is unique about government truly unique about government They're like oh voting i'm like you can you can vote right now oh well you guys have committees you can set up committees all you want you make laws i'm like we get to use aggressive violence in order to achieve our outcomes we're the only ones that legally can do it but they don't consider the chief executive the president of the united states using the federal federal you know government agencies to essentially call up social media companies and we won't say threaten we'll say strongly encourage them to censor people, to deplatform people, to take down certain information. You don't think that use of coercive power constitutes violence or the threat of violence? No, of course not. Why? Because they agree with it. And that's the part where, to your, to your point, they want to use the title of objective journalism, but then they want to engage in editorialism. And, and like so many other things where they have just randomly changed the definition of a word, we all lose faith in something that we used to have faith in. Because the word meant something. It doesn't anymore. We know when we see a title like this, it's like, oh, yeah, it's the Washington Post and, and they're going to editorialize it. And I'm not going to get the truth about what was actually said. And I'm certainly not going to get you know, a, a comprehensive from multiple perspective analysis of what was said. I'm already being told what to think about this. And this is this is what good people think. And if you don't think this way, then you must not be a good person. It's a cult. Yeah. And it, it depends on compliance, right? Like th th what it's, I love what you're saying. Uh you know, if if you don't think this way, then you're not a good person. And at a certain point, you have to look at this other side and say, do I think I want to be a good person under your definition, right? Yeah. Like the people, the values that you think are good, the actions that you think are right, would I also agree with that? And I yeah. think when you start to really critically analyze the the yardstick with which they use to measure character, you don't want to be a part of it, yeah. uh, in my opinion. The word good, who the hell thinks they have the power and authority to dictate what that means? It's subjective. Good, the word God, it's like the same word on purpose. Well, I think that we should have a cultural standard. Like I I wish that we had a strong enough cultural identity where we could all at the table be like, these things are good and these things are bad. And maybe in this room we could, and maybe generally across the political spectrum, there are, are topics where people would say, yes, I agree, that's good. And yes, I agree, that's bad. But I think really the, the details of this get lost. And because we don't have a strong collective identity we don't have a shared sense of uh you know a lot of a lot of morality is dictated by religion you know we're, we're a very diverse 
country. And so therefore, we have to really be careful about combing through and saying, well, what what do we agree is right, wrong, good, evil? Because ultimately, you know that there are good things and you know there are bad things. But if your neighbor has a completely defini- different definition of these things, then you can advocate for completely different policies, which is where we are now. And it might be the same definition, but the situation it means like if you get the best, you, you, there's one sandwich and we're both hungry. We both know what it means. Good is if I get that sandwich, it's good for me. And you know, if you get it, it's good mm-hmm. for you. So we have to fight about whose good is going to dominate. Unless we agreed that good was if we both weren't hungry anymore and could split the sandwich. There, yeah, there are yeah, other. That's not fair because Ian has higher caloric requirements than you. So that's <laughs> sure. or like if it was something you couldn't split up. Like this is um, why we need sandwich equity. Yeah, that's right. Something non fungible. <laughs> I'm just saying if there were like ways that we could agree that there were certain outcomes that are good, but if we always see our our definitions of good is in conflict with each other, then we're never going to have a compromise. Well, I, I think anything. there's also a difference between useful and good. Like mm-hmm. we, you're, when we say good, we have a there's more of a moral connotation to that. So in that situation, what we would do is there's one sandwich you're both hungry and you say no, you take the sandwich. We, we would agree that it was useful that she got the sandwich. We would also agree that it was good that you engage in a, in a form of personal sacrifice to help somebody else. And and so the term can be used both ways, but we would understand the different moral connotation associated right. with it. But oh. it, but we are we are increasingly, to your point, we're increasingly getting to a point where th- this idea of a certain degree of shared values um, is, is just <laughs> doesn't exist anymore. Um, we, we, we literally have half the country that doesn't believe the same thing about this country, doesn't believe the same thing about how it was founded or, or the fundamental principles that informed it, doesn't believe that on the whole, it, it's been a, a force for good. But, but they don't believe anything. Yeah, well. I, I think the important thing to understand. You think it's just nihilism? No, 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 no. It's a cult. It, oh. is, it is a brain dead cult. Mm. And so you take a look at what, what happens to somebody when they start reading. Yannicka Sparian's a really great example. She reads a story about people in Long Island who have cut up two people uh, or who are accused of. They were found in a home with blood and guts in the drains, body parts strewn across all over the house and scattered around Long Island. And when the police arrest them for these crimes, they said they're not bail eligible and let them go. What happens? The left attacks her for it Mm -hmm. because she's deviating from the cult. So uh, there's a, a viral video among the left right now, massively viral, where Haya Raichik of Libs of TikTok was at uh, university, I believe, and some guy in the back laughs at something she says, and she goes, you have a question? He goes, yeah, how do you define woke? And she couldn't do it. She said, it's like anti-normalcy, and um, um, it's like, didn't have a good answer. And uh, I think for a lot of people, they can they can sort of understand when they see something that is woke, what it is, because it's almost, it's almost a root word itself, but they don't actually break it down. So I, I typically break it down Uh, There are a lot of conservatives that define it as like postmodernist thought, blah, blah, blah. And it's like, no, 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 that's not correct. Because when you take a look at the left as a whole, you see masking, forced vaccination, lockdown policies, pro-Ukraine war. You see, uh, uh, and of course, the postmodernist stuff is a component of that. But these things don't have a shared ideological root. The the only thing that woke is, is cult-like adherence to leftist social orthodoxy, an orthodoxy of which is amorphous and has no moral framework. That's why they can simultaneously say war is bad and the military machine is awful because they're funding Israel and go Ukraine, fund Ukraine. You're like, "Eh, okay, I can understand if you're like no war, but these people who are screaming about Israel have an overlap with people who are screaming about defending Ukraine and they go on their live shows and they and they preach this stuff. They claim my body, my choice, but you better get the medical treatment we demand or there's no moral framework. Nothing makes sense. It is simply a swarm of bees. That's not fair. Bees are nice. Wasps. <laughs> Wasps. And if they and, and ma- many of the people within the hive just feel in the swarm, if I deviate, I will be obliterated. So I'd rather be in it than out of it. Mm-hmm. There's no moral framework at all. So I think this is a lot to do with the uh, the end result of atheism without a moral framework. So I'm not saying you have to believe in God to have a moral framework. What I'm saying is this country historically had a Christian moral framework. This is not, I'm not offering an opinion. I am not making a, 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 a value assessment on the benefits or otherwise of religions. I'm saying a Christian moral framework gave us the, uh, the Bill of Rights, protected our rights, gave us property rights and a whole bunch of things. Eventually, over time, you start seeing the rise of secular uh, thought, atheism. And these people like Bill Maher, who's in his 60s, Believe it or not, Bill Maher still has a Christian moral framework, although you can see it's it's weakened. Why do I say that? He believes in free speech. 
He believes in the innocent until proven guilty. He's not a very bright guy. Fine. He doesn't read the news. But you can see he has this moral framework where he's like, you know, free speech. We should be allowed to speak. Well, that all of these things come from a Christian moral framework. When you get the next generation who are raised by the likes of Bill Maher, they're postmodernist. Nothing you say matters. There is no truth. There is only power. And I must wield it. And you must do as I say. And that's what the left is today. I think that if someone has no moral framework, that they'd be easier to teach morality than if someone has like a misaligned moral framework. That would be challenging to unlearn the code. So it's easier to teach these people that are still, they might be 25, 28 years old, but they don't know what love is. Like, Well, we, you, you could argue there's default liberals who are just saying, I, I, I guess, and they're marching mm -hmm. along with the news. And now we are seeing a lot of Gen Z say they're going to vote for Trump. There was a poll that was fascinating. 65% of Gen Z, the, the, highest fact, the highest percentage for any, for any demographic saying Trump was more likely to shake this country up for the good. And that like Gen Z, it's, it's remarkable. So yes, these younger people are growing up realizing what's going on and they're saying, yeah, I think they were lying to us and Trump's probably better. So it's probably true that the people who don't know anything, but the clarification here is the woke, these are, these are people with no moral framework. There's no morality. We had uh, Stephen Marsh, who mm -hmm. wrote the book, The Next Civil War, who repeatedly said, I don't want to hear about morality. I don't care about morality. It's meaningless to me. And he said, Children should have books teaching them how to do adult sex acts in their grade schools. Why not? And I'm like, morality comes from a logic of can we improve society? It's not arbitrary. That's why atheists like Bill Maher like the founding documents. Not all of them, but, but a lot of them praise things like free speech, but don't understand how that moral framework gets you these good things and how those good things make a great country. We, so this is real. Th I find this fascinating. Um, I, I wrote a paper. I, I was taking it. I was doing a college course and it was about ethics and the intelligence community. And everybody, and one of the, the papers we had to write was about what is the biggest ethical question facing the intelligence community? And this was at the height of like rendition, um, you know, enhanced interrogation tactics. And so we're writing all this and I, and I contact my professor and I say, I want to make the argument that it's postmodernism. Wow. And he goes, how are you going to sustain that? I said, if you'll trust me, I, that's the argument I want to make. He's like, okay, go for it. And to your point, because the, the point you made about the generational component is very, very important. And, and the argument I made was, if you have objective truth and objective morality, that generally, if it's going to be objective, it has to be sourced from the divine, right? In the United States, the religion was Judeo-Christian values. And what they did is that provided an objective moral framework. So it wasn't subjective. It was, no, this is wrong or right because God says so. And we also see the practical benefits from the application. So- you have a society where the the overwhelming uh, you know proportion of the population believes this um, and applies it. So they they believe in it, they believe in the benefits, and they believe in the source. I said then when you start to get in the the sixties and you have the increase of of postmodernism, what you have is people that want to they want to separate good morals from the source. Well, now you just lost the objectivity. So they're still living in the benefit of okay, everyone culturally kind of believes in these good morals, but we don't have the source. But then you start to go into this realm of like Maslow's hierarchy of needs and, and self-actualization. And, and if postmodernism is correct, then there is no such thing as a meta narrative. There is no such thing as objective truth. And now all of a sudden you, you move, you, you removed um, the source. Now all of a sudden the morals get to get redefined. And so the same Bill Maher that will, will just sit there and be shocked at a kid that shoots up a school because he wanted his, his internal pain to be felt by somebody else. That was his, that was just his self-actualization. And Bill Maher looks at that and goes, that's wrong. What do you mean it's wrong? Who are you to tell me what's wrong? Morality is subjective. My morality said it was correct. And the thing is, is Bill Maher knows it's wrong, but he doesn't have a con intellectually consistent argument that he can make for why. And this, this happened fascinatingly with the Gravel Institute leftist uh, organization, uh, Mike Gravel was the, the former senator. Uh, some kids started using his account to tweet and generate a lot of attention. They started the Gravel Institute. And after January 6th, they tweeted that it was a good thing it happened, but it was the wrong people who did it. And so naturally, when the narrative came out, it was insurrection was bad. They deleted the tweet. Yeah. But you had leftists outright saying they like it. And I, I can tell you this. You go to any leftist in private, Antifa, and say, what do you think about January 6th? They'll say they wish they did it. They wish it was them and they wish they succeeded. 
So that's the, that's the only the, the issue. only the only thing the only thing I question is that I do think they have a moral framework. I just think that there's no intellectual consistency consistency to it outside of of two things: group identity. Because to to your point about this idea that if they deviate at all, they don't just get they don't just get ostracized. They don't just get um, punished for it. They lose their entire identity because in order to be a part of this group, you give up your individual identity. That's not important anymore. The the only benefits that you get from what identifying whatever you want to or being trans or being this, you you can you get all the benefits of being able to do whatever you want, provided that you stay within the group orthodoxy. That's the cult like behavior. Yep. And then there's this other narrative, and that is the oppressor versus the oppressed. That's that critical theory Marxist version of it. So you've got postmodernism, which doesn't provide any sort of objective moral framework in which to operate, combined with critical theory, which essentially says that the only moral imperative is oppressor bad, oppressed good, and everything is about how do you consolidate political power. Well, if that's your only imperative, then you can essentially justify anything against somebody that goes into the oppressor category on behalf of somebody on the oppressed category. They can make anybody an oppressor. Yes. They just simply decide. Like that yeah. hilarious article that said straight black men are the white people of black people or something like that. <laughs> Do you I was remember always... that one? <laughs> no. I'm sure I can find yeah. that. Oh, I, my I was God. like kind of. Uh, skeptical of, of Christianity growing up just because yeah. I was very logical. And I was like, if you don't show me the data and the prove it, the God thing, then don't t you already told me the Easter bunny was real. I don't believe your lies. <laughs> I got it. Okay. I found it. Straight <laughs> black men are the white people of black people. I kid you not. That was actually the title of this article. They need to justify make. So Pete Buttigieg is an oppressor. Why? He yeah. says he's heteronormative. So they said he wasn't actually part of the marginalized community when, yeah, that's right. Buttigieg, I think he's he's gay. He is. Doesn't matter. But he's not he's enough. cis. Is that not cis? Cis means you're straight, doesn't it? No. Well, cis it, means... on the on the intersectional pyramid of grievance, he doesn't have enough points. He's not grieved enough. He, he's, he's a white male. Enough. Yeah, he is. Yeah. But he's you're a, a white man. A position of power. One? Well, we, I, I was talking. To, I was talking to a room full of of like mothers and stuff like that, and they were asking like, I can't believe what's going on in our schools, and I can't believe that we have all of these kids that are now identifying and suffering from gender dysphoria and whatnot. And I said, I'm actually surprised the numbers are as low as they are. And they're like, what do you mean by that? I said, well, imagine something. I want you to imagine you walk into a classroom and you are told by virtue of your skin color or by virtue of your gender or by virtue of your sexual attraction, you're an oppressor. Now you can't change your skin color. Like there's no change in that. You can't, you can't deal with that. So how do you, how do you move from the oppressor category to the oppressed category? I'm bi, I'm trans, yep. I'm non-binary, I'm pansexual. You adopt all, as many oppressed characteristics and now as possible. All a, now all of a sudden, look, well, I, I said this the other day, I'm like, the left has no use for straight white, or has, the left has no use for white men unless we put on a dress and then we're the most important people on the planet. Mm -hmm. They will bend over backwards to appease us once we do that. Yeah. I mean, this is what I thought about with affirmative action, especially when it came to college applications, right? It was a joke among my friends when they were applying to college. Like, well, maybe I should just start ticking every box that I can come up with because it it betters my odds, which means that, you know, especially with teenagers, you wonder how often this is a very genuine feeling or how much of it is just a fad to fit in with people around them. When if yeah. you were to just be like, oh, yeah, I'm straight and white, you are suddenly not not just like not cool, but you are actively a force for harm. Mm -hmm. But just by virtue of being you. It's a busted morality. I, I But I would love to talk about Christian morality for a minute if you guys are into it, because I have some questions about particularly. Uh, loving your enemy. Mm -hmm. I think that's a big part of Christian. And uh, I talk a lot about pardoning people and political power, just mass pardons, forgiving those that have wronged you. And a lot of the feedback is, Ian, you idiot. They're, if you if you pardon these people, they're going to continue to destroy you. So like, is the Christianity, is that love your enemy thing like on purpose to make us slaves to those that do us wrong? Or are we supposed to love our enemy? No, you, you are supposed to love your enemy. You understand loving your enemy doesn't mean you let them out of jail if they're a mass murderer. You, you, you can still have love for the person that that is someone that is created in the image of God and you desperately want them to come to a place of repentance and changing the way that they behave and the way that they treat other people. But it's also appropriate that if somebody decides to engage in that sort of activity, that they be locked up and separated from society. So there's no contradiction within Christian and morality when we say love your enemy, but at the same time that there's a moral obligation to protect society and the innocent. But, but, but there's also a really easy, easy way to put it. Do you love your child when you let him eat ice cream all exactly, day and yeah. stick the fork in the power? outlet that's not love tough mm -hmm. love that's not love at all love would be saying i want you to be better and the best way to go about that is rehabilitation mm -hmm. you are going to prison for the crimes you committed
I love you, so I'm going to punish you. Absolutely. I understand it. That's how set, I grew set, up. Like, well, well, but, but wait a second. Wait a second. But, but let's look at the problem because there's, there's punishment, which is, which is harsh and doesn't come from a position of love. And there's punishment that does come from a position of love. So when I discipline my child, I don't do so because I want to cause pain. I don't do so because the punishment is what I'm looking for. I'm doing so because if they've engaged in a behavior that I know is bad for them and bad for society, I have one of two courses of action I can take. I can either explain that to them and then I can explain why what they did is harmful to them and disrespectful or harmful to others. And then I can create a, a, an environment to where they understand. And, and we always, like punishment in my house was more built around the whole restitution. Like if you hurt your sister or if you did something like that, well, then it's like you have to make amends to the person that you, you hurt because I wanted them to associate. You didn't, you're not in trouble because daddy says you're in trouble, right? You're in trouble because you hurt another human being. Right. And, and you need to make restitution for that. You need to make that right. Now, I can either set that discipline up in an environment which I can control that, that allows them to learn and fully grasp that lesson out of love, or I can just let them get away with it. And one day the state will deal with them and the state is not going to be anywhere near as nice or concerned with learning that lesson as, as daddy is. And so that that's the important component of punishment within a Christian moral framework is this idea of about bringing about repentance and restitution. Um, it's not just punishment for punishment's yeah, sake. Yeah, you're not seeking to see someone suffer. No, no. Which is why we got rid of the cruel and unusual. We we specifically eradicated that from our governance style. Yeah, yeah. Technically, yeah. Well, that that was yeah. I mean, it was certainly the influence behind it was this idea that there's that there's a certain degree of, of punishment that is by its very nature in and of itself evil, even if it's trying to correct something that might be you know inappropriate behavior let's let, let's lighten the load a little bit with very very heavy conversation and now let's talk about bad things that are kind of funny we have this story from the new york post california's 20 dollars fast food minimum wage balloons menu prices with some chains increasing costs by nearly two dollars i just all all these laws do is literally just destroy your economy okay yeah. so uh let's see what we, what we have do they have the photos here there was uh there was one photo I thought they had it where the prices were uh, here we go okay so they do they, they do have do they have the double menu okay here we go so this one's Burger King a Whopper meal was eleven eighty nine what is it now twelve forty nine a Texas double Whopper was fifteen what's a Texas sixteen eighty nine whoa went up by a dollar eighty that's crazy and then you look down at In and Out and it was a uh, double double it's a double meat double cheeseburger. Five dollars and sixty-five cents. Now it's five ninety. They have just increased the price of all the food because you passed a law saying you got to pay more. You didn't change anything. In fact, the only thing that changed was they don't have the, the additional money in their coffers, so they fire people until they can get there. Mm -hmm. I talked to a guy, an accountant. New Jersey was raising the the, the uh, minimum wage, and it was going up like fifty cents, and he was like. It's going to go up 50 cents and then six months, 50 cents more. We're talking about in a year, this, this is going to be a 10% increase. Now, imagine you're a business and you have thin margins. Your, your margins could be 10%. And now you're seeing a 10% labor cost increase. So now your margin's 2%. Of course, you're going to raise your prices. But if you raise your prices, then people aren't going to shop there. They're going to say your prices are too expensive. He said, when they put in the, the, the increase, I think he said something like 20% of my clients shut their businesses down. Yeah, And it's because... In their bank right now, they have $10,000 and they got to make payroll and the money comes in and when the money goes out and there's a little bit on top, they, they, they set up a rainy day fund. And then when they do this dramatic change, they're like, we don't have the extra thousand dollars to make payroll. What do we do? Shut her down. Take the money that we have left. We'll keep it for ourselves and we'll, we'll, we'll try and start something else. Under staff. We, so we had yeah. a bill, we had a bill, Virginia House of Delegates raising the minimum wage in Virginia statewide. So keep in mind, the, the Loudoun County is the wealthiest county in America. Oh, yeah. Loudoun County is the wealthiest. Lee County, Virginia, the median individual income is $18,000 wow. a year. So they were going to change the minimum wage for all of Virginia to $13.50 an hour. Drastic increase. Because right now it's like 11 because um, Loudoun County can afford it. Oh, yeah. Loudoun County doesn't care. In fact, all the legislators carrying and cheering this on are all coming from counties that are significantly wealthier than, than the poorer counties in Virginia. 
And when you point this out, and this is this is this is one of the things I hate when people get up and you actually you're supposed to explain your bill. They don't explain the bill. They give you their hopes and dreams and aspirations for what they hope their bill will do. And so this bill is going to lift people out of poverty. This bill is going to. I said, you know what this bill does? Like technically, does everyone want to know what it legally does? You will make it illegal to offer someone a job for thirteen dollars and forty nine cents an hour or less. That's all the bill does. You hope it will do all these other things, but what it actually does is make it illegal. Think about that for a second. You've got a county where the the median individual income is $18,000 a year. We're making 12 bucks an hour is a pretty good gig. Nope, yeah. illegal. You can't do it. Why? Because a bunch of representatives who know this much about economics uh -huh. and who know it's not going to actually affect them get to go on TV and talk about how much they care about the working poor right. when in reality they just cost their jobs, they cost their hours, or they made everything they're going to buy more expensive anyways, which will eat into the the supposedly pay increase that they they got. Who who was the lady who said 50 bucks? You saw that in California? Oh, yeah. She's like, we'll make it $50. It's just like, okay, you'll just eradicate every business. Make it a hundred or you hate the poor. Yeah, that's right. Rest in peace to all the franchisees that could never afford that. It's yeah. going to make the business, the, the business itself might make money, but every franchisee is just like, do well, you, there goes my business. Bye-bye. Do you guys uh, remember in, uh, was it 2019, 2019-2020 uh, uh, cycle, Bloomberg, I think it was it was this, when Bloomberg was, he put half a, half a billion. Mm -hmm. And then that woman was on TV and she was like, he put 500 million into this race. That means he could give every American a million dollars. And then, and then the anchor was like, wow. <laughs> yeah. Let me pull that up. Yeah. Team, no, I don't think that's how this works at that, all. That math doesn't math. <laughs> Slow down there. No, it is interesting because I think you're right. It's, it's a political talking point for someone who is in a district where their constituents aren't going to feel the difference, right? Like if you're representing the wealthiest county in America, yeah. and now we can all say, oh, great. So we have raised the, the minimum wage. You know, it's mostly to pat yourself on the back and pretend like you're doing a good thing. Yeah. We, well, and, and the problem is, is that the, because of this narrative, because of the advertising, because of the fact the media doesn't do their job, I had a room full of students come into my office and they were FFA students, right? Future Farmers of America. And they said, what's what's some of the biggest legislation that's going to affect, you know, agriculture? I said, <laughs> the minimum wage increase. Mm -hmm. And I asked these students, they said, how many, how many people in the labor force, what percentage of the labor force do you think makes minimum wage? And the average estimate they gave me was 50%. I said, it's less than 3%. And out of those 3% making minimum wage, the vast majority of them will not be making minimum wage six months from now, as long as they can keep the job. Mm -hmm. Because that's how upward economic mobility works. Yeah. But if you take them out of the labor market at the very beginning, because now they can't get a job or they can't get sufficient They're hours. They're not in the market. They can't go up. They can't go up, right? Yeah. But that's okay. They got a welfare check for that. So, so it was uh, Mara Gay from the New York Times talking to Brian Williams. This is the New York Times. So the- uh, Why did they fact check that? I believe the uh, the clip has since been deleted by everybody. I don't. Yeah, it doesn't exist uh, anymore. But uh, circled the, wagons on that the one. quote was, let me see if I can pull up the quote. Uh, during her discussion with Williams and former New York City uh, Bloomberg's campaign, blah, blah, blah. But then she suggested that Bloomberg could have given each of the 327 million Americans $1 million and still had money left over, which would have been better. A uh, better use of his cash? Yeah, no. And then, uh, oh, was, what was this? Uh, it was, it was, was it, oh, Brian Williams, I think he brought up someone saying that and said, it's an incredible way of putting it and gave her part of greed. It's an incredible, incredible way of putting it. It's true. It's disturbing. <laughs> It does suggest what we're talking about here, which is that there's too much money in politics. <laughs> These are the people that are at the New York Times and MSNBC. And so if you wonder why it is they lie and they're dumb, well, it's because of the people they hire. Good New York gosh. Times editorial board member saying it is true. He couldn't know. He could have given everyone, I think it was like a dollar twenty seven yeah. mm -hmm. or something like that. A dollar. They couldn't even buy anything off the dollar menu now. That's that's too. <laughs> there is no dollar menu. There's anymore. no dollar menu. Well, it, we we always we always kind of in a dark humor way. It's these minimum wage increases are should be called the no kiosk left behind bills because the, the more difficult you make it to hire somebody, and it's not just the the wage component. It, it's all the different rules. Beating this the, guy. Oh, sorry. Oh, it's all the different rules. It's all the different restrictions. Every time you do that, what you're telling small business owners is we're going to make hiring someone a bigger liability for you. So find something else. Let me just play this clip for you. But you see it as a possibility if he wants to spend a billion bucks beating this guy, he could do it. Absolutely. Um, somebody tweeted recently that um, actually with the money he spent, he could have given every American a million dollars. I've got it. Let's put it up yeah. on the screen. It, when I read it, 
Uh, tonight on social media, it kind of all became clear. Bloomberg spent 500 million on ads. U.S. population, 327 million. Uh, don't tell us if you're ahead of us on the math. He could have given each American one million dollars and have had lunch money left over. It's an incredible way of putting it. It's an incredible way of putting it. It's true. It's disturbing. It's true. It does. It does suggest you know, what we're talking about here, which is there, there's too much money in politics. Um, and it makes it difficult because what we want in politics are these the, days. These people vote. Wow. <laughs> they vote. They have TV shows. She's right. She's an editorial yeah. board member of the New York Times. Oh, yeah. has well, And us. they mentioned in our first article that I guess afterwards she tweeted like, Buying calculator BRB, which yep. I appreciate the self-deprecating humor. On the other hand, you went on national television and were like, and this is true. I read it on the social media. Like, <laughs> And they team. all, like, the producers didn't catch it. Yeah, There's, like, two producers it has to go through before it gets to Brian Williams. He reads it on the air, and he's like, wow. And she's like, yeah. This really fits into our narrative nicely. It's crazy how that worked <laughs> <Wow>. out. <laughs> That's just so crazy that we live in this reality. Uh, yeah. but, but these are the people fact-checking. So don't worry. But like, it's, it's disturbing and true. Yeah. I want to go to the reality where they live underground and are super high tech and they have like high speed magnetic rail trains and stuff. I'm tired of this junk reality where idiots run the show. <laughs> I don't know. Not everybody's an idiot that's running the show. I just see the idiocy. It was a dollar fifty three per person. Five hundred million divided by three hundred twenty seven million is one point five three. What could you buy in today's economy for a dollar and fifty three cents? Arizona iced tea. <laughs> yeah. Can you now? I feel like that no. went up too. It, it's a dollar twenty nine, I think. Oh man! Yeah, well, you, you buy have Bitcoin with left it. owner. Yeah, you could buy a dollar fifty three of Bitcoin, <laughs> which is worth like two dollars. Zero 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 zero. It's yeah. remarkable. I do think uh, you guys talked about kiosks just in the bathroom, but uh, this whole raising the minimum wage is is just bringing in the age of automation. Employees yeah. are going out. Yeah, the minimum wage workers on its way out. Well, we we were talking about it before. I, I think okay again. Don't quote me on this, but I'm pretty sure I read something where that $20 minimum wage in California, that there was a special thing that was put in there about baking bread. And it and if like, I think it was like if you bake bread mm -hmm. on site, yeah, the you're not subject to the same minimum wage laws. And oh, oh by the way, Panera gave a ton of money yeah. to Gavin Newsom. The, the CEO of Panera is a huge Newsom donor. Yeah. And this was the only way out. In fact, the, the bill got proposed and they got brought back to the table. They were like, except for places that you bake your own bread yeah. you don't have to do this keep in mind panera once opened up a shop i think it was was it in new york city they opened up a store somewhere where you just paid what you could right and it was going to be this very it, yeah it was Does that, right. is that store still so open it is not interesting it, 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 it turns it turns out it turns out a lot of the the hipsters going in there decided they couldn't pay anything for yep. the sandwich they were getting john bon jovi did that actually had a restaurant where it was a pay what you can thing and it just kept seeing the meme over and over i don't know if the restaurant's still open i should look into it so oh, uh the, the latest reporting is that panera will raise their wages to 20 dollars an hour but that 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 story from bloomberg yeah how panera bread ducked california's new 20 dollars minimum wage law yeah. Oh, I love that they will out. do it, but they don't have to. They okay, don't have we'll to, but we'll no, who are they going to hire? I mean, yeah. if, if you're a, an employee yep. that's looking for jobs, are you going to go to Panera where you don't get paid? Like, If you bake the bread and sell it as a standalone item. Mm -hmm. Oh, I, I was waiting for like McDonald's. Watch McDonald's Burger King is like, hey, would you like a roll with your yeah. meal? Like that's <laughs> they're going to they're going to have like one and little stove in there. That, but, but think about it. They cook one, you know, double arch roll every morning. Yeah. And it's 10 bucks and then they're sold out. Yeah. And oh. then they. That's all they got to do. All right, it's broken along with the ice cream machine. <laughs> uh, right. Bon Jovi's restaurant is still open because of the JBJ Soul Kitchen. It's open. It's a community nonprofit restaurant. Yeah. Pay what you will. Yeah. If people can't pay, they invite them to pay what they can. And what if that is nothing? Yeah. I think then they feed them anyway. It looks like it's a nonprofit, so yeah. maybe it's funded. So it's a good getting, tax write-off for him. Yeah. It's yeah. exactly what that is. That's not a business opportunity. No. Necessarily. Not supposed to be. No, you know, it's just supposed to you help know how him. those go. Nonprofits are great business opportunities. Yeah, yeah. Not you, supposed uh, to be profitable. But... Just ask the Clintons. I mean, it's it's it's. This is what these businesses do. You have you have a company. Let's say your profits are going to be a million bucks. You start a nonprofit, and then right before the end of the year, you donate that million dollars to your nonprofit, and you pay zero taxes. Your your company's net, you know, your 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 total taxable income then is ah, it's only seventy thousand dollars in profit. So we got we got to pay uh, you know, you know, twenty thousand dollars or whatever in taxes. That million dollars that we had that we made, oh, that was donated to charity. Does it get stuck? my charity that I own? Yeah, yeah. that then, buys yachts. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, it take, takes people on charter fishing trips. <laughs> That's right. <laughs> Depending on the uh, the charity, 
They could just donate that money again. This is, I, I remember when, like, didn't Zuckerberg give a bunch of his money to an LLC? And the media reported, like, Zuckerberg's giving all his money away. Yeah. He was actually putting it in an LLC to protect it from taxes. He's giving it all away to himself. Yeah. That's right. <laughs> yeah, the Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation. Can a charity give money to a charity? Yes. Yeah. Do you then write that off? Yeah. Mm-hmm. Well, not nonprofits don't pay well, taxes. Well, yeah, they don't anyway. pay taxes, so they don't got to write so it off. So you wouldn't get a yeah. negative. No, no, no. Okay. no. The, you can, you can they, they're, you, there are tax credits where you actually get money back from the government based off of how much you, you donate to something, unless it's, you know. And but this what, is how grants would work, right? What some companies do is you got 200K in profits, you give it to a charity. Then you, as a consultant for that charity, get paid a portion of that money, which you then donate again. So there's a, there's a lot of uh, dirty games people play with taxes. And yeah. this is why tons of rich people have nonprofits because nonprofits can basically do anything. Look, you, you, got, you, you take an Uber, take an Uber, uh, nonprofit pays for it. Yeah. So, so if you need to put your, your, if you, if you want operating income that's shielded, then you just have a nonprofit that works in a similar space that legitimately will do things, right? Let's say uh, you have a nonprofit that actually uh, donates food to the needy. Mm-hmm. Well, you, in the process of doing that, be like, oh, yeah, I'm, I'm having a meeting with someone. We'll put it on the nonprofit. And so you, some of your operating expenses can be diluted by these people putting it in nonprofits instead. Yeah. Or other businesses and things well, like and that. And this is, Dave Chappelle talked about this, where he was, he was talking about the debate with uh, Trump and Hillary, where Trump was like, yeah, of course they took advantage of this stuff. It makes me smart. Mm-hmm. If you right. want to change the laws, you can change, but you're not going to because your major donors take advantage of all of these things. <laughs> and they won't let you. And it was like, man, Mike Trump. That was, that was one of the be- most stark moments of that entire debate. Yep. Yeah. We're going to yeah. go to Super Chats. If you haven't already, would you kindly smash that like button, subscribe to the channel, share the show with your friends, head over to TimCast.com, click join us to become a member and support our work directly because this show is made possible thanks in part to viewers like you. We're going to have that members only uncensored show coming up for all of our members at 10 p.m. Not so family friendly, but good fun. But for now, we will just read your Super Chats. So smash the like button. Let's dive right in. Alpha Turkey with the first Super Chat. Wow. Defeating Clint Torres saying 1000th episode feature Tim in all white. If I owned all white, perhaps, which I don't. <laughs> There's time. You could buy all white. What is it? Uh, next Tuesday? It's coming up, right? Wait. Wait, is it next Tuesday? Hold on. We should just do the thousand. Wait, no, 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 no. Oh, okay. Wait, wait. The eclipse is Monday. Oh. <laughs> okay, good. Where do we free, fit into free, the Just, just throw in an extra episode and make that one your thousand. Episode nine, nine. Oh, right. Yeah, episode nine, nine, nine will be during the, will be on the day of the eclipse. Dude, this is, and it's. Episode one thousand the next day. Yeah, you got to put together it's all a new white day. outfit, dude. It's gonna it's blow a, it's people's It's a it's a new reality. The Large Hadron Collider is gonna fire up. A particle is gonna burst, doing something to the eclipse and the rockets in the air. And the then, Euphrates will dry up. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Hear about it all on our thousandth episode. <laughs> the, the eclipse just stays for three days, and uh. we're like, ah, crap. <laughs> Clint Torres says, "Howdy, people. Howdy, Clint." Wow. Jungle Run says, "Don't call them criminal aliens. Call them colonists." It's actually pretty good. Yeah. I like invaders personally, but Sea Cowboys says Nick run for governor. No, no, <laughs> you totally can't make me. Oh my god, you gosh. can't make me. No, but thank you. I appreciate it. I appreciate the sentiment, unless of course you realize what a horrible job that is. And <laughs> Stephen says says rumor is that Ian has a birthday. Happy birthday, Ian! May you have many more. Thank you. I actually got a gift. I'm going to open it at the end of the show. Yeah. And Allison uh, slaved over a store-bought cake drawing <laughs> hexagonal lattices. She did. She made a graphene cake. Yeah. Out I, of I, not graphene, though, I don't think. It's, I, I told her we should get an Oreo cake to sprinkle the Oreo dust and tell them it's graphene. And then she drew the hexagonal it lattices. It's really good. <laughs> I don't think I'm going to eat it, though. You're just going to stare at it and yeah. praise it. Photos of well, it. And you, you, can, you can make that personal sacrifice <laughs> and give remember. others your birthday cake. Yes. Oh, yeah. That yes. is morally cake good. Cake equity. Give I want cake, cake equity, equity yeah. for the yeah, Tim cast. All right. Let's grab some more. Matt says, not first, but it is my birthday today. No, 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 no hold Ian's on. It's birthday Ian's today. birthday today. <laughs> <laughs> you get your own birthday. Happy birthday. <laughs> Do you have a twin? It's a good year for birthdays. No, I don't. You mean it's a good year. What year is it? 2024. But is it like the year of a... Why did you say it was a good year for birthdays? It's a good year for birthdays. I've been saying that for Everyone my whole life. Everyone birthday. <laughs> what year were you born? Uh, no, 79. 79. Uh, is that a, what is that, a rabbit or something? No, that's the, oh God, I should know this by now. The year of the monkey? I no, thought it was, I yeah, want to be the monkey, but I think I'm the pig. I think I'm a tiger. No, I'm the goat. I'm the goat. 
<laughs> oh, it's, 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 right? Yeah, 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 yeah. Okay, I remember we talked about this before. Yeah. Ian think. takes the Ron Swanson approach that birthdays were made up by Hallmark to sell cards. Yeah, <laughs> <laughs> they're psyops. Get you thinking right. about things other than what's important. Yeah. The Authentic Hydro PX says, "Been waiting to see Nick here again. MTA is such a great podcast. If oh. possible, Nick and Master Hines would be great for Culture War episode on the Founding Fathers' vision and how the Feds messed up." No, oh, thank you. Yeah, he's talking yeah. about the Making the Argument podcast. Uh, me and Christian and my wife Tina on that, and Hamlet. It's yeah, we, we definitely. Oh, that'd be great. That'd be great. That the yeah. founding fathers messed up. No, no, no. That the federal government messed up the founding fathers' oh. intention. Like we we had a we had a whole episode once where we dedicated it to what would we change about the Constitution, and the two things that we would change are the Sixteenth and Seventeenth Amendments. And the Sixteenth Amendment, I think, just destroyed federalism. Everyone focuses on the Seventeenth, which was the popular election of senators, but the federal income tax is what destroyed federalism in this country. I just reading a lot about that today, actually. Yeah. Nico Barney says, Nick, at your last pints and politics at the Uville Brew. I floated the idea of a national divorce as our country and culture continues to divide. Do you still think federalism is possible even though federalism has grown too far? So yeah, the federal government. So yeah, I do. And I do. And, I, and I'll tell you why. Because if you look at what's actually going on in Texas right now, this is an excellent example of, of a quasi-constitutional crisis where Texas goes down there, they start to secure the border. Federal government challenges them. They come in, Article 4, Section 4, we got the border, it's our authority. But then they don't do anything about it. And then Texas says, okay, fine. But we're still going to do it. Like, okay, you, you've got your ruling, but we don't get to submit to a, a an invasion of our state. And you having the authority to secure the border also means you have the responsibility to do it, and you're not doing it, so we're going to do it. Now you, now you force this issue with, is the federal government actually going to come down and expend resources preventing Texas from securing their own border. And that's where you get these sort of these crisis moments where you had, I think, I think you had, what was it? An additional 24 States that actually made public statements like Glenn Youngkin made public statements, mm -hmm. supporting Texas and their decisions, sending troops. We sent the Virginia national guard to Texas yep. uh, to assist with that. So I, I still think that I still hold out hope for this idea that the federal government, the States are going to push back against either the federal government refusing to live up to its constitutional responsibilities or overstepping its constitutional boundaries. What what makes it difficult, though, is the 16th Amendment, which essentially gives the federal government the ability to extort the states with their own money. Oof. On Red Shirt Skeptic says, Nick, thoughts on Youngkin vetoing the gun control? Oh, yeah. He, he's he's vetoed just about everything. There was one like it was an auto sear bill that's already federal law that didn't really change anything. And then there was there was one other bill. um that he let go through that didn't do much. It basically said that the problem with it is that if, if a school says that, Hey, we're, we're notifying you that your child might hurt himself or someone else. If you then allow that child to get a, access to a firearm and they hurt someone, you can be held criminally liable. There's some, there's some issues for how that could be, potentially be abused. Uh, but it, it wasn't a huge deal. Like we reasonable people could disagree, but the big ones like the, the, the so-called assault weapons ban, which is the dumbest thing. A we weapons don't assault people. People assault people, right? And people think that when they hear assault weapon, they think like a belt-fed machine gun. Right. You, you put a pistol grip on any semi-automatic rifle, you just made it an assault weapon, right? That's stupid. You get a Ruger 1022, but... Make, put it in black. Oh, you got a Ford grip on it? Oh, it is, uh, now it's become a salty, right? So that that he vetoed that. The other big one that was just ridiculous was this safe storage bill. And again, this is one of these things where if the press actually did its job, people would understand how bad some of these bills are because they think, oh, safe storage. Yeah, you should keep your you should keep your gun locked off so your kid can't get it. So I asked a question on the floor. I said, okay, if your bill goes into effect and my 16-year-old daughter who's been shooting guns since she was five, like knows how to responsibly handle a firearm. I'm away. Cops, I live out in a rural area. Somebody kicks in my door to hurt my daughter. She grabs my pistol and defends herself with it. Am I now a criminal? And the answer was yes. Yep. That's what it means. So Governor Youngkin has vetoed um, all of those, like all, all of the, the egregious right. gun bills he's vetoed. So good job, Governor. So you you're find you're happy with his performances, Governor? You, yeah, yeah. I, I th look, there, there's always going to be things where you disagree with somebody on, but uh, he's probably going to set a record number of vetoes this year because there's a record number of stupid stuff coming across his desk. And I, and I think he's been very, very diligent on, on getting rid of some of the worst stuff. So I really appreciate it. Do you find yeah. that clarifying the bills as they're being discussed helps the governor make a better decision on his... Y yes. Well, I, I think it's important. I mean, uh, understand that when you're talking about politics, you're talking about consensus. And so sometimes when people ask me, like, when, when you debate on the floor, do you actually think you're changing their mind? I'm like, no. Like very, very few times do we actually change anybody's mind on the floor, but I'm not speaking to them. I'm speaking to everybody that's going to watch that clip 
that I then push out on social media. It's another reason why people ask me why I don't do press conferences. I'm like, why would I want the Washington Post to lie about what I said <laughs> when I can go to Instagram and put it on there and get 500,000 views, yeah. which is more than the daily circulation of the Washington Post, mm -hmm. right? So it, yes, it, add, it adds clarity for, the, for constituents, and then it also sends the right signal to the governor and whatnot. Again, I don't think he needed a signal for this. He knew it was the wrong thing and, and did the right thing, but yeah. Daniel Gagney says, happy birthday, Ian. It is also my birthday today. Thanks, Gagney. Happy what birthday. What did we say? It's only Ian's birthday. <laughs> yeah. Stop trying to steal H Ian's thunder, HBD. He's, no, he's, it's HBC. Whenever I see your initials, I think, happy birthday, Claire. That's not what it means. <laughs> All right. Max Reddick says, Tim, according to reports, Governor Whitmer authorized criminal aliens to be sent to Livingston County, where I reside. Really concerned about how the police will handle it since residents won't put up with it. Look into this. Interesting. Well... Uh, we saw what happened in Staten Island. Did you guys, you guys remember that when the low, when they sent buses of criminal aliens into these neighborhoods and the residents came out, the cops started attacking the residents and arrested them. And so it's like, I bring this things up and then people are like, stop breaking out the police. And I'm like, Staten Island cops attacked their own community to defend criminal aliens who are illegally invading this country. I don't know what, what you want from me. It's just those bad cops in all of these videos all the time. I get it. Good cops are quitting. All right. What do we got? Grab some more super chits. James Black says, Nick, let's go. Where are you going? Oh, let's go. Might actually be a reference to uh, 2nd of the 325 Airborne Infantry Regiment. Oh, right on. That was my uh, first unit in the 82nd Airborne, and let's go was our motto. Charles G says, Nick, you should move to West Virginia to represent us. We are better than Virginia. Love your YouTube shorts. <laughs> I appreciate it. You know, uh, Jason Maris, the attorney general of Virginia, he kind of put out like a funny tweet um, reminding West Virginia that they're that them seceding from Virginia is not something that we uh, we we appreciate. And we're now going to petition the federal government to bring West Virginia back into Virginia, uh, which I think would be an excellent addition. We would love to have you guys back. Ooh, that would be yeah, great. Right. I don't think we want to be with you guys. You pushed too hard. You may end up with an East Virginia yeah. as well. So watch out. Although the funny thing is uh, the story of, of how West Virginia came to be. All of the young men are conscripted and go fight. It's Virginia at the time. And then the people who lived there were like, okay, I'm in favor of voting to leave. And yeah. And so I couldn't imagine being a young man being told you have to go fight for your state. You say yes. And then as soon as you leave, like, okay, now let's vote while they're not here. And then they do and they take your home from you. Then yep. people come back after fighting and they're like, it's not, it's a different state. No, there, there is a very, there is a very good constitutional argument to be made that West Virginia did not legally become a state. It was just convenient for the union at the yep. time. And so they accepted it, but yeah. Yep. And then afterwards, Virginia wanted it back and the Supreme Court said, shut your mouth. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> We're not giving you well, there are counties in uh, Virginia that still have clauses in their their char charters that they can go be part of West Virginia yeah. if they want to. Like, I, I would also point out that, um, yeah, the, the famous song, West Virginia, is about Western Virginia, not West Virginia. No, no, no. no. I'm just jealous. You, country Roads? Country Roads. If you look at everything he talks about in that is in Virginia, not West Virginia. Uh, it's actually written about uh, Montgomery County, Maryland. Well, let's all so agree. Let's guys, all agree to not believe that. So the his <laughs> wow, it's trying to start something, true. and you're wrong. <laughs> so here's what happened: the guys who wrote it, uh, who was it? John Denver. John Denver. Yeah. So yeah. that was it. Was written and sold to him, I believe. It can't just be about Montgomery County because he they mentions were, things that are not in Montgomery County. They were driving through Montgomery County when the guy came up with "Country Roads Take Me Home." Oh. And then they thought Montgomery County, Maryland, doesn't really sound very country. So let's just they they went to a library pulled out a book on West Virginia and started looking up things in West Virginia and then putting those things in the song it was written by Bill Danoff Taffy Nevert and John Denver the three of them i don't yeah. know i'm just learning about this as we go they they Western decided western maryland also wants to be part of west virginia so i'm just saying yes. yeah. it's a great state well i mean you've got the what the panhandle of uh, of of maryland this mm -hmm. thin yeah. strip that yeah, goes yeah. along, an interesting. and it's it's all MAGA country. Yeah, mm -hmm. you, you like we, we they're went, not like Baltimore. We went to a restaurant and bar. It was really fun during uh, during COVID lockdowns, and it's like mask mandate on the door. You walk inside, and everyone's just like nobody's wearing a mask. <laughs> and they had they had one of those Trump flags where he's got an Uzi on on a tank. Yeah, and there's explosions behind him. <laughs> he's like writing a velociraptor. Very, yeah, exactly. <laughs> <laughs> yep, they had those two. Uh, yeah, and we were like, this is MAGA country, baby. All right, let's grab some more Super Chats. Michael M. says, given the popularity of RFK, if something were to happen to Biden, could the DNC reclaim RFK as their candidate for November? Probably not. They don't want him. Yeah. Could they? He's, he's, he's not in line. He's not in line. 
And they're probably going to be like, even if he was, we can't trust him. Yeah. The CIA is going to be like, we killed his dad and his uncle. So <laughs> he's never going to work with us. Yeah. <laughs> Whoops. I think it's funny. That's basically mainstream accepted now. Like all these prominent personalities just being like, well, yeah, you know, the CIA did it. Yeah. That's wild. Bill Hughes says dead people are moving to Texas. Yep. Yep. How about that? They they're, love it there. Probably there's just demons. They're a very loyal the bodies of other people. They're very loyal voting demographic. <laughs> the text vet says just saying record amount of illegal immigrants. And now there's a record number of non ID vote requests. Seems odd. Certainly. I don't know what you're implying, sir. There would never, <laughs> ever be any How corruption in the voting system. <laughs> That's sarcasm. Voice the People says, don't forget about the Rolling Stone article called Biden is building a superstructure to stop Trump from stealing the election. They are telling you what they plan to do to keep Trump from office. Yeah, I love how Time Magazine wrote an article. What was her name? Molly Ball. The shadow campaign to save the election. And they literally <laughs> called what they did a conspiracy. Oh, Behind the scenes, a conspiracy was unfolding. Those are, that's and what they Molly wrote. Ball? Yeah. It seems questionable to me. Yeah. Jennifer Reems says, I would like, I want to thank Nick for his history of Rome episodes and introducing me to Mike Duncan's history podcasts. So happy to see Nick on here tonight. Love y'all. No, thank you very much. Yeah, that was an awesome podcast, man. I don't know if you've ever listened to it. I, I don't know if you guys, you know, that whole trend went around, like why do, how often do men oh, right. think about the Roman empire? I actually have a mug that says, yes, actually I am thinking about the Roman empire, but Mike Duncan did this excellent podcast. I don't, I mean, his politics, I think are crap, but, um, podcast is good. 175 episode, uh, podcast of, of the history of Rome is excellent. Outstanding. It is. It is funny though, because men were not shocked at all. And it's actually kind of confusing that women are shocked, but it also shows you the general oblivious nature of women. <laughs> In, but what I mean is there's two things. One, they don't know what guys are. They don't ask guys like, what are you, what's, what are you currently thinking about? And the guys probably say nothing. And it's because they're thinking about Rome and it's like nothing relevant to say yeah, to you. Yeah. But the, the, the big talking point was that uh, there was that viral clip where it's a, a guy and his girlfriend walking in a mall and she, and it was made by a woman. She's like, here's what I'm thinking. She's like, making my way back there. Da, da, da. And then the guy's going, okay, two exits to my left, one to my right. There's a guy in front of me looking kind of sketchy. I better make some space. The guy's constantly thinking about safety, security, planning ahead, and the woman's oblivious. Well, and just that video along. is, what, the original one was like, what women think about when they're with a the man they trust. Uh. It, it wasn't when it was just like all the time, right? <laughs> like it, if you're with someone who's reliable, who is worried yeah. about your safety, you have the luxury of not thinking about it. And I think that th that is the difference between men and women, which is that th their brains are constantly, well, if you ask a man, what are you thinking about? And he says nothing. I, I doubt they're actually thinking about absolutely nothing. It's just such an abstraction. Whereas women are constantly monitoring every situation because th their brains are required to do different things than men. I, I got, I got in, I got in trouble with the man council. Uh, Cause I, I did a reel on that where I said, all right, ladies, I'm going to let you in on something. When men say nothing, it's, Probably I said, that's an option, but it's probably not worth it. It's probably one of three categories. I said, we're either probably thinking about something like how I would occupy a Costco during the zombie apocalypse, <laughs> you know, because yes. I'd have everything. <laughs> um, or I'm thinking about maybe the Roman empire, or I'm thinking about that thing you wore with the corset and the, I said, so it's one of those things, right? It's, it's, it's like, you know, nothing. resistance Rome or rated R, right? Like those are the three. <laughs> That's a great Categories way of putting it. That's funny. Yeah. The, the how to occupy a Costco during a zombie apocalypse. Oh, yeah. Hit the nail on the head. Oh, my God. If, if only we could, if we could get rid of the ABC in Virginia so they could actually have like, you know, whiskey and Costco. And if we could add like a, a, a <laughs> firearms and ammunition section to Costco, it is the perfect zombie apocalypse. Well, there's Costco. Are you listening? This <laughs> is how you improve your business. There are some states where Walmart has booze and guns. Yeah. And so, and, oh, yeah, that's true. That's yeah. true. Yeah, I, I, I where was I? I can't remember. Maybe, is it Texas? Maybe that, that, no, I don't know. That sounds like it would check out. <laughs> maybe not though. Texas sounds like they might have like booze laws of some sort. I can't remember where yeah. I was. Where it was like they had booze and they had guns, and I was like, wow. You could build like an entire city in a Costco, like a small village, because of the high ceilings. Yeah, yeah. That, I mean, I, I mean, not that I'm going to let a ton of people in there, right? But like, you know, friends and family, sure. Again, but, zombie apocalypse. Like, well, you to could secure a Costco. securing a Costco would require a decent amount of people. Yeah, you, you've got rotating. Uh, you need patrol. You need uh, how many exits? On well, the, that's on all about your that's six it, or I mean, seven. Uh, I think it's actually fewer. Than, well, I know it's probably six or seven because yeah. it depends on if they got one of the tire facilities and the whole deal. Like you got to yep. think this stuff. You got to turn the roof into and like a chicken you, farm. Yeah. You're, you're how many how many guys per per 
point of egress do you need? Well, you want to do shift cycles, right? You, well, do, you don't want to do 12 hours at a time. So you got to do But then the other thing too is if you can properly barricade some of those exits, you can probably get it down to like two or three. And now, now you're operating. But And you want to hit at the right time, right? You want to hit at the time where they like have hot tubs and stuff like that. Like and, that's and, oh, yeah. So and you're lying there with some really yeah. nice things. I've Zomb- thought about this, man. I've zombies, thought about this. Zombies not being known for their intelligence. Yeah. You, you could actually probably properly barricade and not have to worry about strategic attacks on your Costco. Whereas if you were dealing with like an invasion from extraterrestrials or a foreign force, you gotta yeah. guard the roof, totally different scenario. So yeah. after we go through our mind and we're, and we're thinking about zombies, <laughs> then we go, but if it was aliens, we have to do roof security yeah. now. Right? Or do the zombies climb walls? walls and, and, I'm not, and I'm not going for a Costco when it's aliens, right? Because they're smart enough to go for population centers, right? They're thinking about this. <laughs> They've probably been listening to this conversation. Right? When we say nothing, it's one of three things. <laughs> they're here. They're doing Intel right now. Yeah. <laughs> So no, yeah, but, no but, to the Costco. Yeah, no to the Costco. Or yes, where are we at right now? Yeah, it's funny because like I'm on my phone and my girlfriend's just like wondering what I'm doing, and then she looks and what was the, what was the last one? I think the last one I was looking at was like frogs that were squeaking. Yeah, and I'm like, I don't know. I'm just look, like, there's nothing <laughs> secret going on here. It's yeah. just like a tiny frog going. Nee! Yeah, and then she enjoyed the frogs. So yeah, we we had a good time. Let's uh, we'll grab a couple more super chats here. Raymond G. Stanley Jr. says, PA recently passed automatic voter registration. Here we go. Automatic? How's that work? Probably like motor voter laws. Yeah. Or, yeah. Call Me Tag says, Nick, you are an inspiration to countless young men trying to find their way in this crazy world we're living in. Thank you for all you do for this country and your countrymen. Tim and the gang, keep up the great work you guys do. Love you guys. Appreciate it. Yeah. yeah. Thank you. Here's a good one. Troy Erickson says, Tim, you... You always say we must create culture. Would you co-sponsor? Would you sponsor a songwriting contest? You could gift the winner a video and uh, for their song and exposure. We certainly could. Uh, it is a challenge. the The trash trash house team is basically like Carter, and then Kent is uh, Kent, Carter Banks for the music. Kent Welling does all our video stuff, and uh, that's why it's like a, a song every couple of months. And we we ob- like we've done my songs a bunch, and we obviously want to do more songs and more bands. But it's just it's really difficult. But this is a pretty good idea. So I don't know. I got to talk to Carter, to Carter about it because he's in charge of all that stuff. But uh, that could actually be pretty pretty cool. Um, however, I'll tell you guys right now, I guarantee that we'll get a thousand submissions and 999 will be like razor blades for the ears. <laughs> it's a lot of time. I don't mean to be a dick. Yeah. It's just like sometimes it's a diamond in the rough. And you're like, wow, this person wrote a banger. If they if, if they get even like some basic recording and stuff, it'll be huge. And then there are people who have masterful production. You're like, yeah, it's just not good, man. Yeah. It's just not good. I don't know, but different strokes are different folks. Just because we don't like it doesn't mean it's, you know, it's not for other people. Laurel says, I'm an immigration lawyer specializing in illegal aliens. 99% know they can't vote. They only break the law when there's something in it for them. Someone may be stealing their identities, but they aren't doing it themselves. I think... Nobody is going to submit a deceased person intentionally for verification because they know it'll get kicked back and that number is going to appear somewhere. I think they've got a list of names yeah. and they're just sending the forms in. Yeah. 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 Well, and that's that, and that's, a, that's a lot easier too to manage, right? Tr- trying to get a bunch of people lined up in order to go in and, and falsely register to vote, that, that's problematic. Like just sitting there and, and requesting absentee ballots or, or registering, you know, that, that's, yeah. MF Damien says eclipse alignments cause gravity anomalies uh, where this eclipse crosses paths of the 2017 eclipse is directly over the new Madrid seismic zone. Hope X doesn't mark the spot for that cutting loose. Yeah, it's going right over Eagle Pass, too. Hmm. Yeah. The darkness. Ma- Madrid seismic zone. He calls Next it. week's going to be wild. <laughs> <laughs> Man. Let's go. Brian Egan says, Tim was driving today when I passed what appeared to be an active crime scene, Marshall County, Tennessee. Ton of cops, cameras, three letter agents, no ambulance. I think they pulled a fill and found all that remains. Well, okay. I don't know what happened. It was a long joke. Yeah. To get to that punchline. <laughs> That's what that was. That was good. We'll grab a couple more here. A couple more while we're still here. The text vet says, Nick is thinking the police, BP, etc are the same old guard. They aren't. See reality. All the good ones quit, were fired, and have been replaced. Look at the girl victim shot and killed by the cops in Cali that went viral today. Oh, yeah, did you see that? No, I didn't. This is nuts. A, guy, a dad kidnaps, his, murders his wife, kidnaps his daughter, yep. high-speed chase, 
the 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 cops are on scene and the one cop's yelling to her, "Come to me! Come to me! Go get out! Get out! Come to me!" She runs to her. The other cops shoot and kill her. Wow. Yeah. What? That's insane. Wow. How do you accidentally shoot a 15 year old girl like that? With with with, and then he goes, "Stop shooting her! Stop shooting her!" And he's like, "Okay, okay." And then I guess they realized afterwards they they shot and killed her. Jeez, that's crazy, man. But that is just you know it's important to mention. Well, look, three look, 300 million interactions. That's not all. Shit yeah, I, 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 I go with the. Yeah. If, if you look at the total number of interactions between law enforcement and people, I mean, obviously, the vast majority of them are not ending in, in a situation like this. I do think that you have a significant problem with respect to the recruiting and training of officers. You're seeing the same thing in the military right now. And I think it's it's intentional. Right. You're, you're watching departments because typically if you look at the military and if you look at law enforcement, you're usually getting people that are a little bit more dedicated to the concepts of law and order. You're usually they're usually a little bit more conservative or whatnot. Um, and, and I think they're actively trying to change the culture within these departments and within the military. And um, yeah, and, and I, I think it's definitely causing problems. So I'm, I'm not I'm not blind to that going on. Right. I, I don't believe in blindly supporting, you know, it, it, you know any sort of profession. Uh, without understanding that people are individuals. Um, I can respect that somebody that wants to, you know, enter a profession for the right reasons to try to protect people and they put themselves in harm's way to do so. I can respect that. But yeah, there's going to be, there's going to be bad people and they need to be held accountable because quite frankly, when you do have somebody in law enforcement or in the military that is deliberately corrupt or bad or evil at their job, it's, it's doubly, it's doubly bad because yeah. they, they've not only violated the law, they've also violated the public trust. Yeah. KCB says flipping Texas wipes out 10 deep red state electoral votes. One Rust Belt state is all Biden would need. And that and, and so, you know, we're all sitting here thinking like, look at these swing states. Trump needs to win. He's going to win. And their play is Texas. Mm -hmm. Maybe it is. And then maybe Texas and Missouri somehow end up flipping and they go, wow, this is a surprise to everybody. How could this have happened? Trump won the swing states he needed and Texas went blue. Missouri is interesting. Yeah. Very interesting. We should keep an eye on these numbers every week Man. on these registration numbers because those those are crazy. All right, my friends, if you haven't already, would you kindly smash that like button, subscribe to this channel, share the show with your friends, head over to TimCast.com, click join us for the members only show. We'll be starting soon and we've got uh, more to talk about. Not so family friendly, though, so you want to put the kids to bed for this one. You can follow the show at TimCast IRL. You can follow me personally at TimCast. Nick, do you want to shout anything out? No, just thank you again for having me on. Uh, anybody that wants to follow me, nickjfreitas.com. We also have our shows, uh, The Why Minutes and Making the Argument. Right on. That's awesome. It's been fun having you here. That was my uh, blast. I'm Hannah Claire Brimla. I'm a writer for scnr.com at Scanner News. You can follow all of our work at Timcast News on Instagram, Twitter. If you want to follow me personally, I'm on Instagram at hannahclaire.b and I'm on Twitter at hcbrimlow. Happy birthday, Ian. Thank you, Hannah Claire. And you reminded me, uh, this what is it going to be? April 27th. It's a Saturday, Austin, Texas. I'm going to be performing at the Minds Festival. It's uh, festival.minds.com is where you get tickets. I'm going to be playing music with Toby Turner. We've got a comedy set. It's uh, sort of like Tenacious D. It's ah. fucking hot. It's so good. So we'll be kicking the show off early, and then it goes late. It's like 5 to five to midnight. We'll be doing uh, roundtable discussions, debates, comedy, music. So come on out to Austin. It's tickets.minds.com. We'll see you there. Cool. Happy birthday, man. Thanks, man. Yep. Uh, thanks for coming, Nick, as well. Appreciate it. My pleasure. And uh, to everybody else, see you later. We'll see you all over at TimCast.com in about a minute. Thanks for hanging out.